check if we have the volume on the computers in here. Right Good now. morning, everybody. Good morning, Damon. You can hear us in the, in the room. There we go. Give me a moment here to uh, get my affairs in order and find my stuff. Okay. Well, welcome to the March edition of the State Building Code Council meeting. Um, finally got some sunny weather and longer daylight hours, so yay for that. Uh, I'm Damon Doyle, your chairperson, and uh, we'll start off by uh, doing introductions. I'll just allow the uh, this council to please start off by uh, introducing yourself. Roger, you're the top one on my screen, so I'll start with you. Okay, I'm Roger Herringa, SBCC member representing the structural engineering community. Welcome. How about Jay? Good morning, everybody. I'm Jay Arnold, Deputy Mayor for the City of Kirkland, representing cities uh, west of the Cascades. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Schmidt, I think you're new to the council. Mike. Yeah. Hi, I'm Representative Suzanne Schmidt. I represent the uh, fourth legislative district, which is Spokane Valley, Liberty Lake, um, Millwood, up um, up to Elk in the Elk, Washington, and over to the Idaho border. And I'm very uh, very happy to be on this board. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ben. Good morning, uh, Ben Omura. Council member representing mechanical engineers. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chair, Todd Bayreuther. Greetings, uh, Todd Bayreuther, representing manufacturers, suppliers, and installers of building materials. Wonderful. Pete. Yeah, hi, I'm Pete Rieke. I represent persons with disabilities. Thank you, Pete. Mr. Anderson. Cheryl Anderson, uh, representing architects. Great. Okay. Uh, Ty? Ty Metzer, Thurston County Commissioner, representing counties west of uh, Western Washington counties. Welcome, Ty. Uh, Justin? Justin Borgo with Sheet Metal Workers Local 66, representing Washington State Building Trades. Okay. Tom Handy. Hi, Tom Handy. I'm a Whitman County Commissioner representing the uh, Washington counties on the east side of the state. Welcome, Tom. Katie. Hi, everyone. This is Katie Sheehan, um, and I represent the general public seat. Okay. I'm um, looking here. I see some staff. Uh, uh, Representative Rommel. Hey there, Alex Rammel, state rep from the 40th district, uh, representing the House Democratic Caucus. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, did I miss anyone? Is there yeah. uh, any members of the public that would like to? Uh, Actually, I'm, I'm oh, oh, sorry. You, oh, sorry, Angela? I'm Angela Haupt. I represent the code enforcement officials. I'm sorry, Angela. I didn't didn't recognize your name. Welcome, uh, welcome aboard. Mm hmm. Uh, is there any members of the public that would like to uh, introduce themselves? Uh, Laura. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Boyd, and I'm here representing the city of Bellevue. Welcome. Mr. Chappelle. Micah Chappelle, Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections Technical Code Development Manager and the Washington Association of Building Officials Technical Code Committee Chair. And former SBCC member, thanks. You were you weren't kidding when you said we couldn't get rid of you. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Doug, please go ahead. Doug Engel, <clears throat> Doug Engel, representing Robertson Community Land Trust. Welcome, Doug. Uh, Dave Cocott. Dave Cocott, Spokane Fire Department, uh, past president of Washington State Association of Fire Marshals, and hopeful 
position for the fire service with council once appointed. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Okay, uh, hearing none, we'll move on to the uh, agenda. Uh, can I get a motion to review and approve the agenda? Uh, what the point moved. Uh, I, I can I can barely hear you. Yeah, can can we switch uh, agenda items uh, six and uh, uh, six and seven? Six and seven. Uh, yes, I I am. I'm I'm happy with that. Does somebody want to make a motion to? We have, we have the uh, emergency room for the barbecue, uh, and uh, we are expecting this will be shorter. So if we can have it before the week, five and six. Five and six. Sorry, five and six. Apologize. Five and six. Okay. Uh, hey, uh, Damon, I'm going to jump in real quick. Uh, yeah. I might have missed it before any uh, motions. Uh, did did we get a determination on the record that we have a quorum present? If if you said that, I'm sorry if I missed it. I did not, uh, my, by my count, we do, but uh, will, would staff please confirm that we have a quorum? Yes, we do have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, Stoyan, you're, 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 for whatever reason, you're very uh, distant from your microphone. Uh, the microphone is on top of my head, so I don't, I don't know why I will, I will try to raise my voice. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, Demon, this is, this is Roger, also point of order. I'm just used to having um, attendance taken officially. Okay. I'm not sure if just having the staff suggest that there's a quorum is acceptable or not. I'm, I'm not the sergeant at arms here, but I'm just used to us doing an official uh, attendance taking. That, that is fine. And I'm happy to do that. We, we have 15 council members and I'm sure I've introduced at least 10, but uh, uh, if somebody would like, if a staff member would please take attendance. Chell Anderson. Present. Jay Arnold. Here. Todd Byrother. Here. No. Here. Damon Doyle. Here. Tom Handy. Here. Fox. No. Here. Roger Haringa. Here. Matthew Hefner. Craig Holt. Ty Menzer. Here. Ben Amora. Here. Pete Ricky. Here. Katie Sheehan. Here. Uh, let's see here. Ex officio members. Lauren Lethrock. Here. Senator John Levick. Representative Alex Rommel. Present. Suzanne Schmidt. Here. Senator Wilson. Linda I'm here. I'm here. And Assistant Attorney General um, Dirk Mirabachtel. Hi, all. I'm here. Thanks. You have four. Thank you. Roger, is that satisfied? Yes. Okay. Um, would somebody please uh, make a motion to switch items five and six on the agenda. I'll make a motion uh, to approve the agenda with item five and six, uh, or sorry, six and seven. Was it six and seven? It's five, five and six. six. Okay, with items five and six uh, switched. Okay. There's a motion and a second to approve the agenda with item six coming before item five. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries. Hey, Go ahead. Chair Doyle, this is uh, Alex Ramble. I, I will just say I'm not going to fall on my sword on this one, but I just think it's a best practice for us to stick to the agenda as published. People plan their day around this schedule that we set here um, to be able to attend. So I just encourage us in general to try and um, stick to the agenda we set uh, once it's been published. Okay. And I, and I, uh, I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, in this case, we had people that had signed up to to testify on item six and which is why it was requested to move it forward uh Chelly, you got your hand up did you ask who they asked for a vote of the affirmative on the motion no i, I actually asked if there were any opposed and heard none if, if uh I, formality if you'd like me to ask if 
for everybody to vote aye, I can do that as well. I mean, that's my understanding of how the rules work is that people have to actually vote for it. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, going back to the motion, there were no nays. Do I, uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. aye. <laughs> Thumbs up counts too, so I'll take that. All right, thank you. Um, there is no public comment on that item, so I'm going to move on to item number three, which is review and approve the minutes. I Can I have see, a motion, please? I see Larry Andrews is raising his hand. Uh, well, we're we're now in item three, so there there was no public comment on item number two. So item three, uh, review and approve the minutes. Uh, Larry, did you have a comment on the minutes? Larry Andrews. Normally from the past, we've always recognized the people that are here from outside the council that they were here viewing this. I, I guess, is that, are we not doing that anymore? Or? No, I, I did ask for introductions from the, the uh, public and I had three or four. Um, if you missed that, I apologize. Yeah, I, I missed it. I, I just want to be recognized that I'm here. Thank Hi, you. Hi, Larry. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Is there a uh, motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Arnold. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that, Tom. Clarification. Are we approving the minutes on the screen just from the... February 16th, or does this also include the February 15th meeting minutes? My agenda shows both. Um, I'm waiting for the screen to catch up here. Can, can we scroll down to the agenda, please, to item number three? I just want a clarification on the motion itself. Yeah, so I believe this is a motion to uh, approve both the meetings from the 15th and the 16th as listed in the agenda. Jay, is that your motion? Correct. Okay. Um, yeah, we're looking, we're, we, it appears we're looking at, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is, this is, is the minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, any discussion on the motion? Uh, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number four is public comment on items that are not on the agenda. Is there any public comment? Uh, James Knowles. Um, uh, yes, Chair. Uh, my name is James Knowles with <laughs> Amarex and the, uh, uh, and the Fire Equipment Manufacturers Association. And we'd like to take the opportunity to talk about the certification of personnel for alternative fire extinguishing systems, if you'd allow us. Uh, we had spoken to Stoyan and understood that maybe we could get 10 minutes. Would that be all right, sir? Uh, I Please please proceed. Uh, um, may I have permission to share my screen so I can show the PowerPoint presentation that I have with me? Yes. Waiting for permission. There we go. Someone is a panelist. The control should be at the bottom center. Okay. Bottom center. Share screen. Then I will. There we go. Um, so thank you very much for the time, Chair. I appreciate it uh, greatly. I am Jamie Knowles with the uh, manufacturer, uh, the Fire Equipment Manufacturers Association and Amarex Corp out of Alabama. Um, I live in Spokane, Washington. Uh, I have been a, I was a licensed technician in this state for 15 years, uh, servicing pre-engineered fire suppression systems and uh, uh, and fire extinguishers. Uh, we're here today to talk to you about the certification of personnel for alternative fire extinguishing systems. 
Um, and we are organized with the group of people that you see on the screen there. David Pelton from the National Association of Fire Equipment Distributors uh, is online or is supposed to be online with us. Uh, sitting next to me is Kendall Lindicott from the Oregon Fire Equipment Distributors and Metro Safety and Fire out of Portland. And, and then Bill Taylor, uh, one more person to my left, uh, um, is the Western Regional Manager for Ty Barker uh, um, in Burlington and in uh, Vancouver. So we have uh, several other opportunities or, or companies in the state that we're coordinating with as well that are up on the screen. Alexander Gao, Cintas, AAA Fire, PSI Integrated and Fire King of Seattle, Hiller, Kitta, uh, Kitta the manufacturer of, equipment, uh, of fire equipment, and Johnson Controls, the manufacturer of fire equipment. Um, and what we're here to talk about is this uh, passage right on the screen that goes, that's effective July 1st, 2024, um, where we're requiring uh, NYSET 1 or 2 for uh, in special hazards to work on fire suppression systems. And as you can see in the screen there, there's a carve out or an exception for kitchen fire suppression systems. This being allowed uh, starting July 1st, 2024. Um, and here's where it describes uh, for design, you need the NYSET 3. And here is where it describes that you need the NYSET level two for installation and the NYSET level two for testing and maintenance. Um, back in September, the Fire Equipment Manufacturers Association submitted uh, a proposal uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the chair um, suggesting some new language that would uh, create a second exception for pre-engineered dry chemical fire suppression systems because they're virtually the same fire system that's used in kitchens. Uh, and uh, we also propose for design systems other than pre-engineered kitchens. In fact, let me back up one. The exception is the same exception that has been carved out for kitchens, but we're carving it out for pre-engineered industrial fire suppression systems as well, because they're essentially the same kind of system. And I'll uh, go on to illustrate that. Um, the Package that FEMA sent in back in September also suggested that this language for 901, 904.111. Uh, and I apologize, I'm moving quickly. We have 10 minutes and I'm trying to be very respectful of that time limit. So uh, this presentation will be made available to all of you uh, as will my phone number and my email address if you have any questions. So uh, it's uh, nice that's being required for design. Uh, and, and we would prefer the ICC NAFED certification instead of NYSET. And these yellow passages reflect that. Um, and I'm going to move on to why we believe that uh, pre-engineered fire suppression systems or dry chemical type fire systems are built for cookie cutter type of applications, uh, auto body shops and paint booths and those sorts of nature, those sorts of things. Engineered types of fire systems, as you see on the right in this picture, are one-off fire systems designed for one-off large hazards, and they're specifically designed for that hazard. The pre-engineered type that we are discussing today is just for cookie cutter type high usage applications like paint booths in body shops. Uh, the two different systems, the kitchen system where there's an exception already, uh, uses the controls on the left uh, uh, in order to uh, control and do shutdowns and, and trigger the fire system. Uh, and we were showing you in this picture that the pre-engineered dry chem systems that you're requiring a separate certification for, for NYSET, they use exactly the same uh, uh, controls as the kitchen system. So the detection line, the gas valve, the uh, uh, manual pole station, all the actuation is exactly the same in both systems. And we have two different licensing and certification requirements for these two systems, even though they're almost the same. Uh, these are the competitive products. I was showing you my Amorex products, but the other products in this space are Pyrochem. Pyrochem has a Kitchen Night 2 system and a Monarch system for their paint booths, and they use that control head, that NMCH3 control head there, uh, and the pull for, for both systems, for both systems. On the right, Kit of Badger uses a UCH control head that is used for both their Range Guard and Industry Guard products in paint booths and in kitchens. So uh, it's the same control for both of these types of fire systems. Also, uh, the controls for pre-engineered kitchen systems and pre-engineered dry chemical systems are both listed to the same standard within UL. Um, UL 300 on the kitchen side is mandated in the, in the state of Washington and across the United States. 
And in order to get a UL 300 listing, all of these fire systems first have to get a UL 1254 listing for those controls. So a pre-engineered dry chem system and a pre-engineered kitchen system have the same detection and control listings and the same detection and controls uh, physical uh, um, parts. The uh, biggest issue that we have here is the ICC, uh, the ICC certification for kitchens and for industrial dry chem are specifically targeted to those disciplines. And they're the only certifications in the country that are targeted to these pre-engineered disciplines. So this is a description of the uh, ICC kitchen systems. And you can see that this description is very, and the scope is very targeted to kitchens. For uh, the ICC pre-engineered industrial scope, it also lays out uh, the exact nature of that certification and it's very targeted to industrial pre-engineered dry chemical systems. The NYSET certification, although a wonderful level two to level three certification, are more designed for engineer type fire systems and not pre-engineered cookie cutter types of systems uh, like kitchen and industrial dry chem. So in this case, they show the, uh, uh, for level two for NYSET, they show all of the, uh, uh, the, the items that they go over. And the only place they mention dry chemical at all is in the description at the top and they just use the word dry. Nowhere else in NYSET two special hazards or NYSET three special hazards do they talk about pre-engineered dry chemical at all. So the NYSET two and NYSET three certifications, although they are very good certifications, they're not applicable to pre-engineered dry chemical systems. So we're uh, asking the state to, um, well, we would be asking the industry in this state to take the people that are currently qualified to do this. And as of July 1st, they're no longer gonna be qualified. So we'll have an entire workforce that's been servicing paint booths in this state for a long time, no longer be able to do that. And they're going to be replaced by what you see on the screen, which is, uh, which is level two uh, and level three spe special hazard certifications with NYSET. You can see there's only a total of 17 of these people in Washington and Oregon. And in Washington specifically, there's only 12. Uh, um, and we're going to have a void in the state where all of the body shops and all the wet paint spray operations will not have anybody to service the paint boot systems that, they're already, that are already installed. And the companies that have been installing, servicing, designing, maintaining these systems for decades in this state uh, will be out of work. They'll no longer be able to work on that product. Uh, and so what we are doing here today to summarize is asking for a larger audience uh, at the next meeting, if we could, so that we can discuss this crucial uh, um, safety issue here. Uh, really what's going to happen when we implement uh, the new requirements is public safety is going to go down. The service of these fire systems is not going to be done to the thorough nature that it currently is. And we're extremely worried about that. And we would like to have a, a really respectful discussion with this, uh, uh, this committee about it. Uh, and this is us asking for that audience. So we appreciate your time. Only had 10 minutes. I could have talked about this for an hour, but thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, for everything. And uh, I've given this presentation to Stoyan, and he's going to be distributing it to the group. And we would appreciate a larger audience at any time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I, I, <laughs> thank you for respecting the time. And you actually did it in nine minutes. So I'm impressed. <laughs> um, Representative Schmidt, you had your hand up for a moment. Yeah, and then he said, I, I wanted the presentation, so I was just going to ask for that, but he said that we're, we're going to receive that because that was a lot of information to digest in nine minutes. So um, thank you. Uh, Joe? Yeah, and I wanted to ask, I attempted to follow the presentation. I, I can't say that I did fully. Um, if um, if the presenter could not only send the presentation, but uh, make sure that they clearly state their proposed remedy um, and list out as clearly as possible the three or five reasons why the remedy is appropriate, as well as the three or five challenges if the remedy is not offered. And if there's multiple remedies, then that'd be great too. But it, it sounded like there was a, a single one that was proposed. So um, I, this is all new to me or mostly new to me. So 
Um, I'd appreciate any any simplification on the on the applicant's part. I can absolutely do that. And I'd be very happy to make myself available for discussions with anybody uh, as well. I will have that presentation that that gentleman just uh, outlined uh, to the to the committee by Monday. Wonderful. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, I think I have some similar questions to Chell. I think the, the presentation sounds from a technical sp perspective. You make a very good argument. Um, my question is a little bit administrative. Uh, I'm curious when your original document said it will come into effect July 1st. I'm not sure if that's part of the SBCC. I don't think so, but I'm not sure. And um, also, what can this group do about it? Are we talking about an off cycle rule, which um, we're trying, you know, an emergency rule <laughs> or an off cycle rule, which there's uh, changes in our ability to do emergency rules, I believe. Uh, so really, what are the steps that are we that we as a council are being asked to do? Um, I'm unclear at this point, I think having that information pulled together for a more in-depth discussion next month would make a lot of sense, but those are some of my questions. Just administratively, what are we being asked to do? Thank you. Um, I would simply say that this, this meeting was designed to get the next meeting so that we could have that larger discussion. Um, uh, uh, yeah, in 10 minutes, there's no way to convey the entire uh, uh, the entire subject matter, but we believe that there's real urgency here, and it is being implemented in July, uh, and this is language that I believe that the SPCC has already approved, and it's being implemented, so uh, although we're late, we're not too late, we hope, and we want to uh, have a really constructive uh, discussion about potentially pushing this back. Uh, I'm not procedurally, I'm not exactly sure of how this committee would go about doing that, but, but we're definitely willing to have that discussion and entertain any options. So. Okay, thank you. Dustin? Uh, just to clarify for those who are wondering about that July implementation date, currently in this uh, code language that we're talking about, there's two sections drafted into our WAC. We have a section that goes into effect here today. Um, and then uh, as part of the development process before I was here, there is an extension to the NFA ED requirement that allowed, it was to give the industry a little bit more time to uh, get the licensing and things like that. So uh, it was meant to uh, give them a little bit of leeway to prep for the new licensing requirement, as I understand it. Um, so we do have a, another implementation date for this licensing in July. It's just written into the WAC language, not in the implementation date on our filings. Okay. Uh, Larry, I see you have your hand up. Larry Andrews. They took his hand down. Okay. Uh, thank you for a, a good presentation and uh, I, I look forward to reading your material. I'm sure, sure uh, everyone else does as well. Any other uh, comments on this issue? Okay, we'll move on to item number six, the proposal for emergency rule. Stoyan, you want to give us a brief uh, description here? Uh, I will show my screen. Okay, this is uh, section 308.1.4, open plane cooking devices. Uh, and for many years, the State Bill Code Council didn't adopt this section. And uh, what happened for the 2021 code adoption cycle, we made a series of mistakes. First, the proposal wasn't introduced correctly. And the last one, uh, it was the cherry and, uh, and the cake. Uh, the SBCC staff didn't file it correctly. So it appears that we unintentionally adopted the model code section that in summary will prohibit uh, the use of uh, open flame barbecues on a, uh, on a balcony for you know, multi-family uh, residences. And you know, it's, it's kind of odd, I'm asking you for an emergency rule. You may be laughing at me right now, but uh, because the codes are effective on March 15th, which is today, uh, this is why we're asking for uh, emergency rule uh, to fix this mistake, and then we will follow up with the expedite rule uh, 
the expedite tool takes longer because we need to wait for 45 days. And then if you don't have comments, uh, we can we can file the expedite tool. But again, because the effective date is today, this is why we're asking the council to approve this as an emergency rule. And this will give us uh, time to uh, file uh, whatever is needed. Okay. Could you uh, could you state the language of the motion you'd like to hear on this? Uh, are you, are you to asking? Go ahead. To to adopt formally the old amendment that was in 2018, and not adopt section 30814 from the model code. You're asking for an emergency rule to not adopt. 30814, is that correct? Yes, this is how the language looks like. Okay. So currently we don't have anything in the work, which means we are adopting the model code section. And when we add this, it will clarify that if we don't adopt the model code section, we, we are moving back our existing amendment. Okay, Shell. So I'm just trying to contact, so what, we see on the screen is what was adopted and you're hoping no what you see on the screen is what we're proposing to be adopted okay okay so uh okay th this is the existing amendment and i will show you the section how it looks like the technical advisory group recommended keep the existing amendment which is which is this right and and then there was a proposal which included this section, mm -hmm. the section that we're talking about, and this section was with strike out, which wasn't really a legit proposal for this particular section because it's showing the strike out from the model code, which is what was there before we uh, we didn't adopt this section. So the technical advisory group took it as a proposal. They modified the proposal. And they made it look this way. And finally, to make it again uh, a worse stuff, made a mistake. And the managing director didn't do his job, and I didn't check, which I, I'll take the blame here. Uh, and model code address any need for the current amendment, which wasn't proposed at all. It wasn't a proposal, it shouldn't be filed this way. So nobody saw it, nobody raised the concern until uh, about two weeks ago when uh, Ken Brulet saw it. He made me aware of that, and this is where we are right now. Okay, Ben. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I guess like looking through this and looking at the public testimony that was submitted and attached to the, the meeting information, I don't have any issue with um, adopting the emergency rule, but I, I would appreciate if um, Ken or Dave or, or some of the people who had submitted some of the written testimony could provide some clarification on what the enforcement is is like for either like this situation, because obviously we're not adopting anything um, in previous code cycles, but how has this been handled for evaluating these situations um, from the uh, fire uh, official side would be appreciated if one or, one or some of them could um, help us. Uh, Representative Schmidt. Yeah, and I was, can we get some sort of like effect statement? This is, I mean, it's it's kind of confusing to me what we're trying to do. I think what we're trying to do is back out of a, of an amendment that we made. And okay, there you go. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, uh, Dave Cocott. Uh, good morning. Yeah, you know, this is a surprise to me to see that this occurred because of the actions of the tag. <clears throat> I actually go back to my first meeting that I attended as a guest in I think 2004 when action was done in City of Spokane to remove the barbecue requirements from the code. Um, I believe you can still find on the internet my quote of 
uh, the fire department does not want to become the barbecue police. What that uh, code section required is that we would have to, as a fire department, make sure that there are no barbecues on uh, on decks of apartment buildings and, and et cetera. Uh, we do not have the resources for that. There, so basically it was much easier and it was agreed to with the uh, apartment co uh, complex owners and associations that it's easier for them to do that, put it in their uh, requirements for the rental agreements and things as well. Uh, it has worked very well over the years and basically putting it back on our shoulders at this point would just be a, a very difficult thing. This also happened the same time that the code had a uh, Christmas tree investigation requirement for the fire department, and we've had that one removed as well too. Because we just there's there's not enough resources for us to go and check every business to make sure their Christmas tree is not uh, in such poor shape. So it it was in, intended to be good language in the model code, but it just does not apply for our state. We don't have the problems with the Christmas trees; are much fresher. They, they're cut uh, you know, much later in the season and things as well. So. Uh, uh, that's that's the background for that, and we I strongly recommend that the council do take this action to return the amendment back into the language that, that removes the requirement for the barbecue review by the fire departments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Roger. Yeah, I I you know it all sounds like something makes a lot of sense to me, but I'm a little bit confused as to the open flame cooking section, and then the religious ceremonies in 308.1.7. There is a, a document that was attached to the agenda that showed 308.1.4 open flame cooking devices. This section is not adopted. And then the religious ceremonies. And I there's been talk about the open flame cooking devices on balconies. And I saw one comment. So I'm just confused. Are we are we allowing the open flame cooking devices on balconies oh, and the and the religious ceremonies the 308.1.7 and um i'm i'm confused as the total what we are wanting to what we are proposing to change what we're proposing to change is whatever you see with the, with the underline this is so, the document this is the document for this section 5154a 0308. So when we ask the uh, 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 order typing services, when we ask for the document, we get the entire section, but we are changing only this part. So whatever you see, it's already adopted. It's already in the work. Well, and, and, and Stoyan, can I be clear? You're actually not, you're, you've highlighted the WAC number and yeah. open flames, and that is not being changed what is would be changed is 308.1.4 open flame cooking correct yes this okay. is what i'm highlighting right now no we, just to be clear you're highlighting also the WAC number 5154a yes. so, yes, this, this is what we, we are changing now okay. yes. and can somebody please put up on the screen through 308.1.4 open flame cooking you're saying we're being asked to do an emergency rule to make sure that we include that. I mm -hmm. don't understand the, the question. You want to see the model code language or? I want to see WAC section 51-54A-308.1.4. Here it is. Currently, we don't have anything. We don't have text there because we are adopting the model code. The model code text is not in the work. In the work, we have only the state okay. amendments. Can you then? Can you bring up the the um, the model code language so that we all know what we're approving? I understand we're taking it out of the WAC. Yeah. This is this is the model code language stricken. Does it bother you if it's if so? It's so it will be if we take this action. That will not be stricken and it will be part of the code. Is that correct? No, the opposite, Roger. The opposite, so it, Roger. It, it, it inadvertently got included. We're going back to what we've done in the past and strike 308.1.4. That's that's the request. Does that make sense? So the section that you see with the strikeout will not exist in the published code. It will not exist in the 
No, it's not clear, Damon. I'm I'm more confused than ever. Okay. What so, we're cutting out, what we're adding at the end of the day, will on a one and two story family dwelling. Will so you right now 308.1.4 was adopted and inadvertently. And what we're being asked to consider is doing an emergency rule to not adopt 308.1.4 per the language that was on the other tab that just says this section is not adopted. That's my understanding of what we're being asked to do. That is correct. Okay. Is that, is that better? So the there are no restrictions on charcoal burners and open flame devices. And not, not, not within the code. Okay. Okay. Angela? Okay. So, yeah. So, currently, as it stands today, going into effect, there is the restriction on the open flame cooking devices. What we're looking to do is to create the strike throughs as shown here to take it back to what it has been for all the code cycles since this went into the base code. And currently this is being controlled basically by the building, the apartment buildings, their uh, management, things like that, as far as restricting it for the most part. So basically this would just take it back out of the hands of the fire officials and put it on the building owners. Yes. Okay, Senator Wilson. Thank you. Um, so I'm wondering if the confusion is, it says to not adopt, but what has happened is it was adopted. So should the language not be that it should be repealed? because it was already adopted inadvertently. So let me try and clarify one more time. So when we are adopting them, so we are adopting the model code, in this case, International build, Building Code by reference. And we are adding the Washington State Amendments and their files in the Washington Administrative Code. Uh, and uh, the section here that you see with the strikeout, it won't appear in the Washington Administrative Code. It will appear, we will send it to the model code organization, ICC, and we'll tell them to strike it out. What you will see in the WAC is section 308.14 is not adopted. We don't show the model code section. We don't show the model code section in the WAC. We just say, hey, this section exists, but we don't adopt it. Yeah, if I could, if I could okay. jump for a second to uh, for Senator Wilson, the the there's two things going on right here. Just what does the WAC say? And mm -hmm. and the custom of the council is if they don't adopt one of the model codes, is to just be very clear: this section is not adopted, and that's historically what's applied to this specific section. There's a separate issue with regard to the repeal language, which you've highlighted, Senator Wilson, and that would be what goes into the uh, the filings. So we'll be very clear with the code revisor that this specific section is being repealed. But I don't think that that would need to be clarified within the actual substantive WAC because folks who want to look at the law just want to know, hey, it was it adopted or was it not adopted? And, and that's what this says. Okay. The stricken section one, it's not related to WAC, it's not related to code revisor's office, it, 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 it doesn't exist in, in the WAC. Right. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Looks like we have a hand up from the general public, uh, Micah. Thank you all for the public comment uh, option. I was curious as to what the tag recommended. It seemed like that was shown on the screen very briefly, but I believe it indicated that where the code official requires these to be um, monitored or inspected. And do we have the information on what the tag voted for that language? Uh, I believe Stoyan said you had made a mistake and, and filed it just as the base code or model code language, but that there was a recommendation from the tag for 
added language that said where the code official um, requires. And you did show code language before, even though you're showing me a spreadsheet here, you actually had code language okay, previously. So let me, I will go through all three steps. So the first step was the technical advisory group, keep the existing command. And the existing commandment is, this section is not adopted. That was the first step. The second step was this. So it was submitted. It shows the model code language is stricken. Uh, it's not a legit proposal because it's it shows the existing commandment. Okay. The technical advisory group took it in a wrong way. They thought it is a proposal and they modified it. And this is how the language was recommended for the uh, standing committee and the council. We're required by the, the fire code official and the rest of it is the model code section. Then, and the last step, the last step was uh, how it was filed. And it was filed as uh, struck open flame cooking device, this section is not adopted, so it was never proposed. This is why I okay. said we made three mistakes, three in a row. No worries. Thank you, Stoyan. I appreciate it. And maybe if uh, Dave or one of the other tag members could talk about the proposed tag language that added where required by the fire code official, and if that was viable, and maybe that's the direction we change instead of going back to the old amendment. I just curious. Um, again, I, I have no dog in this fight, but I was just curious as what uh, was recommended by the tag since that's what you showed. Thanks. Uh, Ken, go ahead. Gonna make sure your microphone's working on this. Yep. Okay. So yes, I was the original proponent of adding in that language where required by the fire code official. Um, it was a very contentious item at the tag. Uh, it barely passed to seven to five. Um, it was drafted incorrectly and it should have been uh, corrected during, during either the next committee meetings or the council meeting and it wasn't. Um, therefore, I, I have put in my written comments and wanted to make sure that we all understood that we wanted to go back to the 2018 and prior language, this section is not adopted. So it it um, it was done in error and it needs to be fixed. Um, it's a simple fix. If you would just show the current WAC 5154A and how it's written now, um, and then how it's proposed for March 1524, you'll see the, the difference. Um, and uh, it, it needs to go back to this section is not adopted. That's the, the quickest and simplest thing. Um, if we would like to change it in the future, we definitely can work on it in the next tag section. Um, but in addition, it does create conflicts if it was adopted with um, already a state amendment in 6108, which does allow barbecues on R2 occupancies uh, with LPG. So we've created a conflict if we, if we do adopt this section. So it's best if we just uh, go forward with the recommendation for this section is not adopted. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Chell, I hope you're about to make a motion to uh, uh, file an emergency rule to not adopt section 308.1.4. That is what I'm about to do. <laughs> and I do that. I uh, will make a motion to do so. I guess a question about process. Now that that bill passed, do we need to do a motion to enter into an emergency rule or can the motion include the emergency rule and the and the the remedy within the emergency rule? Uh, as I understand it, and Derek, correct me if I'm wrong, we are simply uh, proposing an emergency rule to not adopt section 308.1.4. Yeah, Chell had a, a good question, Chell. The, the question was regarding the, um, the bill, who's, I'm sorry, I forgot the number, Senator Wilson, would know the that that did pass uh, regarding making some changes to the process uh, the SPCC would use for off cycle rulemaking that that is not uh, currently in effect hasn't been um, it didn't have an emergency clause on it so I, I wouldn't I'm not in a position where I would provide you any specific guidance or advice on that okay then I'll make a motion to uh, 
um, adopt what we see on the screen in lieu of what we previously adopted, which included some erroneous information on, well, which included um, adopting 308.1.4. I'll second that. Yeah, and if, um, I'm going to jump in real quick. The there's there's two steps to this. I'm sorry, this is uh, complex. There's two steps on them. One is the directing the uh, council staff to file the emergency rule to go into effect right away, and then to follow up with expedited rulemaking to okay. correct the error in the uh, in the current rule. That was the intent of my motion, and so I would in include those both those things: uh, emergency rule now and intent to uh, change the rule. Or expedited rulemaking. Okay. There is a motion on the table on the floor. Roger. If I could just ask for clar clarification. Um, Michelle said the motion that is up. My understanding is we are not changing the uh, the three items below on the, and now I've lost it because it's not up there. Correct. That's correct. It's just 308.1.4. Okay. okay. I just wanted to clarify that. No other changes. That's it. Okay. I'll second. Okay, case there was a second. Uh, I, yeah, I think Tom, I think Tom seconded. Um, any further discussion? Roger, your hand's still up. Okay, uh, hearing none, uh, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, item five, the WUI code. Stoyan, would you uh, want to a briefing on this? Well, just in, uh, put it on the screen, uh, she starts. So we will need Dirk to give us advice here. The WUI code, we are prepared to go uh, two different ways with emergency rules. Uh, if you remember, we had a uh, work session uh, last week. The, the last council meeting in February and uh, some language uh, uh, was discussed. The council recommended staff to make some changes. It was related to the initial proposal in the CR 102. We are ready to show this on the screen. Why we need an emergency for this? Because the court is effective uh, today. So we need an emergency rule that will give us some time to complete the filing and uh, it will take 31 days um, after uh, filing when the language will become effective. Uh, the second issue here is that we have uh, Senate Bill 6120 and this Senate, Senate Bill passed legislation, the legislature. It's currently on the governor's desk. The bill is not signed yet and the governor has uh, until March 29 to sign it or or uh, let it stay and the bill will become effective after March 29th. So we are, uh, in my opinion, in a, in a limbo and I, I'm not a person without opinion, but I don't know what I can suggest for this case. Okay, and I, I do see that it, it is, is on the governor's list of bills to sign today. And that began at 9.30 this morning, so. I think we can uh, assume that it's, it's likely to be signed. Um, is there a motion from the council to take action? Uh, I, I, my, the chair's opinion would be to uh, to delete the entire 2021 WUI code. Uh, we already have a 2018 WUI code in effect, and just let that ride until uh, until DNR does its thing. Is there is there a motion? To, to that effect. I would make that motion. Thank you, Tom. It's the simplest way to go forward and we can take care of it at a later date, those things that we're to take care of. Okay. Let, let me clarify something and then again, I will I will refer this to Dirk, but we are prepared to strike the language that was adopted for 2021, 2021 we got, but I'm not sure that 2018 we we could will be applicable. Okay, so 2021 is the, the adopted language, and we are prepared to 
deleted with this emergency rule, but it doesn't mean we will go back to 2018. There won't be any weak code until uh, the Department of Nat Natural Resources develop uh, uh, their maps. Um, yeah, since, well, since you mentioned my name, I'll, I'll, I'll want to second what Stoyan said. My understanding of 6120 is that it would hold off any um, action by the um, SBCC uh, until the DNR mapping is completed. Right. It wouldn't, uh, because the 2018, at least as of yesterday, was in effect, would we not default back to that without uh, presenting anything for 2021? Eric? Well, uh, so a couple, what the bill provides is that once the mapping is done, the council may only adopt those portions of the WUI, right, that are set forth in the statute. Um, but again, that is contingent on the mapping being done. Um, so unless I'm missing something, uh, I think that there isn't a WUI in our state. The code, we don't have it. We don't, we don't put it out there until DNR is done with its, its mapping. Okay. All right, Jay. Uh, my question is um, follow up on Derek's state. Derek's statement um, is uh, for jurisdictions today that have a WUI code I want to do this in a way that allows those jurisdictions to continue what they that they have. Would um, the motion that Tom's made uh, impact? local jurisdictions ability to adopt their own WUI code based on their own findings of fact. No. Okay. With that, then I'd, I'd second Tom's motion. Thank you. Yeah. Joe? Yeah, so maybe I'm not clear here, but we didn't adopt the 2018 WUI code in Washington, did we? We did adopt 2018 and then uh, at one time, with emergency rule, it was deleted, uh, and then we started working on uh, 2021. Yeah, so just to be totally clear, I, it was said before, but I didn't quite understand, because Stoyan, you're really quiet, um, your microphone, so I don't hear a lot of what you say. Um, if we take this action, there will be no WUI code in Washington. Uh, is that correct? There won't be any WUI code adopted by the state. The, 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 yeah. the state yeah. building code council will not have a statewide WUI code okay. until the DNR mapping is complete. And then we could have a WUI code once we adopt it. At that right. Time. But with the limitations that have been um, prescribed by the legislature. Okay. With Thank you. I, I would just want to be really clear on that. Tom? Okay. Yeah, but I, you know, I, I probably didn't read the one that's going for signature right now, but there was at one time a carve out for counties and local jurisdictions that already had mapping in place that was compliant mm -hmm. or that was developing it they could adopt that and continue on with the way they're going right now um so while there may not be a statewide one which i i thought that originally it was gonna go back to whatever the 2018 code said but Maybe that got stricken in a in a striker or something, but but I still think that the local jurisdictions that are already acting with a WUI code type instrument locally, they can still continue to use that. Yeah, the the sixty one twenty uh, changed that language, but the the effect is exactly right, Tom. Okay. Uh, Todd. Thank you, Chair. I, I know we've been over this so many times, but I think what hasn't been said today is can you pre please reiterate why the legislation prevents the adopted 2021 from existing until new maps are made? Right, because I'm hearing that we have no code, but we have an adopted code. But can you can we explain just for for the okay. meeting today? Why well, I the there's, there's immediately prevents us from keeping the 2021 as is until the maps are completed. Well, I I won't speak to the policy reasons why the legislature went down that path, um, but but I can speak to the legal um, effect. Uh, 6120 uh, made clear 
that the state building code council shall not adopt statewide or um, WUI codes until the DNR has completed a new round of statewide mapping. So we're, the agency would be precluded legally from uh, establishing a statewide code until that happens. Uh, and that is why uh, uh, Stoyan is requesting the action today. Thank you. Uh, Angela, go ahead. Okay, so if I understand from this from uh, this legislation, it's saying though that there are only the very specific sections that are listed in it or areas which would be uh, chapter one for the mapping and the hardening. Some of the hardening aspects are the only things that can be enforced even by the jurisdictions that currently have their mapping that they want to use. If I understand, or, or they can adopt the, in, or they can enforce the entire WUI base code, which does not include any state amendments. Am I correct there? Uh, if I could answer that, I'm just gonna read yeah. what, the, what, the, what the soon to be, I expect statute provides, and this is in section four, three rather, uh, four. It provides that all counties, cities, and towns may complete their own wildland hazard and base level wildland or wildfire risk map for use in applying the code enumerated in sections one and two of this section. Um, and those codes are the wildland urban interface code in one and two, the specific provisions, right? So those are the sections that are adopted, the hardening and other sections that you identified. County, cities, and towns may continue to use locally adopted wildland risk maps until completion of a statewide, wild, uh, statewide wildfire hazard map and base level wildfire risk map for each county of the state. And six months after the statewide wildfire hazard map and base level wildfire risk map is complete, any map adopted by county, cities, and towns must utilize the same or substantially similar criteria as the map required uh, by subsection one of this section, which is the DNR map. And it goes on to say in subsection five of section three, that all county cities and towns issuing commercial residential building permits for parcels and areas identified as high hazard and very high hazard on the map required by subsection one of this section are adopted according to section four of this section, that is the DNR map or their own local map, shall apply the code enumerated in section one or two of this section. So that is the, uh, that's what it says. Senator Wilson, I want to I want to be clear about one thing. So, if to the extent that there's any confusion or ambiguity regarding that, and and there might be, that has to do with local jurisdictions' authority, right? That doesn't speak to the SBCC's authority to adopt statewide codes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I was just going to say the um, bill report is pretty easy to read. In the final paragraph, it tells us that upon the completion of statewide maps, the State Building Code Council may only adopt these portions of the International WUI Code as set forth in statute, which includes, and there's four bullet points. So uh, class A roof covering and more information, exterior walls, appendages and projections and driveways, except that turnarounds are required for driveways in excess of 300 feet. Anyway, it's pretty specific there for um, just to, as an easy, um, explanation of what the bill does. Okay. Uh, Larry, you have your hand up. Yeah, I do. I haven't seen item four come up yet. Are we, we missed item four or are we coming back to item four on the agenda? Uh, did I somehow pass over item four? I, if I did, I apologize. Yeah, I don't mind later on, but I, I just want to be able to speak on item four at we, some point in this. Okay. Thank uh, you. Larry, Larry, item four is where we had the uh, the folks in uh, regarding the, uh, the engineer fire sprinkler systems. I, and I apologize if I didn't reach out to see if there was any more comment, but, but we will come back to it after this item. That, thank you. Uh, Mike, I believe you had your hand up.
thank you all uh, again for the opportunity to provide public comment on this item. Um, I do agree that we need the emergency rule to remove or, or more or less, yeah, just remove what we adopted. That way there's no confusion on when and what goes into play. I, I do have a few comments on things that have been stated today on what the legislation actually states. One of the bigger items is it takes away the authority of the SBCC to modify the WUI code or amend it in any way beyond the legislation. I do hope that uh, the representatives on today will work with us in the next legislative cycle, work with SBCC since they did vote to speak against that um, and work with us in the next legislative cycle to remove that language and restore the authority for the SBCC to create a code that is specific to Washington and, and benefits Washingtonians, other than having a model code that is written by other states, other locales that do not uh, identify the hazards or risks within the state of Washington. Um, one of the items too that I wanna point out is my understanding is that cities and counties cannot enforce the WUI code unless they have a wildfire risk map. So if they utilize the map that was put out by DNR that uh, created an interface or intermix area based on vegetation, that that does not identify wildfire risk. So um, my understanding again on the other topic on what states or excuse me, what counties and cities can or cannot adopt is that they can adopt the entire model code or portions of that model code without change. If they do decide to make changes, it falls under a different RCW where they have to bring those amendments for approval to the State Building Code Council if they affect single or multifamily residential structures as defined by our RCWs um, in 1927. Yeah, again, thanks for the opportunity to provide public comment. Thank you, Micah. Okay, any further comment? Uh, uh, Ty, go ahead. I'm just curious, this may not be germane to the decision point we have, but I'm curious on the DNR mapping, does the does 6120 give guidance to DNR as to how that mapping will be redone, like how it will be come out better? And can anyone at a high level tell me what, how, what, what that looks like? Uh, you know, I, Mike, I was going to ask if you would, I knew you had some insight on that. Go ahead. Yeah, at this point, there's no specifics on the criteria in the bill relating to how they create that risk map or what criteria they have to take into account. Uh, I know there are some nationalized standards that we've talked about before, both for the interface intermix mapping that was done for vegetation, uh, and that criteria may be the same for or similar creating the risk mapping. Um, but again, there's nothing in the legislation that says what they have to take into account to, to identify that risk. Uh, I hope that DNR will reach out to uh, maybe the State Building Code Council. Uh, I know they are requested in the legislation to reach out to the Fire Marshals Association or, or the State Fire Marshals for input on that mapping or criteria to develop that map. And then the cities and counties would have to use that same criteria within a, a certain amount of time. But nothing specific in the legislation. Good okay. question. Thanks. Roger? Um, yeah, it's just, it's clear to me that there are a whole lot of questions about how we move forward and what's going to happen in the future. Um, I share Micah's concern about um, the ability of the State Building Code Council to uh, pass building codes that are specific to the state of Washington rather than the, um, the you know, the whole country. Um, but really what we're faced with today, I, I mean, if we voted no, the state legislature has said... <laughs> We can't stop it. So it's like I don't know what the a no vote would happen. So I think I'm I'm ready to vote yes. All right, we need to file an emergency rule so that we're not adopting it. And it's going to be an ongoing discussion over the next year or at the next legislative session about a whole bunch of these things about how we're moving forward. So for the, the business today is I think we need to pass this and say, all right, we'll do the emergency rule go back to the way things were in the 2018 and, you know, continue to talk in the future. Thank you. Todd? Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, as I've stated many times before, it's it's, it's obviously the, the state legislature's uh, um, power to, uh, to do this, and they did it. Um, our authority comes from their power. My question is still, I understand very clearly that 
Section three says upon the completion of a statewide yeah. um, wildfire hazard map, that's when we have to take action. I'm still not clear what um, no action looks like because this does make our state less safe for this period until that mapping is complete, right? That contingency. I mean, not that contingency, that, that, that requirement that the map is done. So I'm not sure I, I wanna vote yes for this and I'm not clear what happens if we take no action. I don't think there's support for that, but I just really want to ask that legal question. Okay, noted. Uh, Representative Schmidt. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, that this bill, that 6120, was um, voted out of the House and the Senate unanimously, and that the legislature does have uh, authority over the State Building Code Council. So, uh, you know, I think that we were duly elected by the people of the state of Washington to represent them. And that's what we are doing in our representation is is um, putting their wishes forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Todd, is your hand up again or? It, it, it is, and, and thank you, Representative Schmidt. I absolutely um, understand that, respect that, and that's what we're trying to communicate to, to the public here. Although I will say that through through the, through the discussions with certain legislators, this wasn't fully understood what this uh, what this preemption is, and I think I think it was very last minute, and and we we tried very hard to um, to help bring the legislators up to speed on on this. So again, I'm not I'm not speaking at all to the the legislative intent, um, but our concern is: are we creating a less safe? Um, situation here as we have to go through the implementation piece. There is a gap here where the state will be less safe because we do not have a WUI code in place. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm making sure I'm trying to do this in order. Representative Schmidt, I think your hand's up and then Angela. Yeah, and that I just forgot to take it down, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Angela, go ahead. Okay, so I watched the hearings on this bill, all of them through the committees, and there was kind of a consistent thing where everyone agreed that it wasn't perfect, but it was better than nothing. And so I think from what I heard from the feedback during the vote of the, the representatives and things like that was that they did agree that in a later action, some things did need to be corrected maybe, such as all of the code language that is currently in the bill, the fact that it did take the power away from SBCC to do the amendments. So, so it was passed and, and, it, I, and I personally think that it was a good thing that it was passed um, and hopefully we can, you know, make some adjustments at a later date. Um, but to, I think, I'm not sure if it was um, Todd's comment about what if we take no action or we do a no action, this bill, once it's signed, basically says, this is what's there. So if we take no action, there's still no WUI code. If we vote no, we want to keep what we've done, it's still null and void, and it still isn't in effect. And so basically, I mean, with the way that this is going with us, you know, you know, deleting the entire WUI or doing, you know, the amendments or whatever, no matter what, this bill supersedes it. And it's basically saying until the new maps go into effect, it's a status quo. So it's the same thing we've been doing. We don't have a WUI code, basically, except for some jurisdictions which have done their own mapping and have been enforcing, which those jurisdictions are able to continue doing this as long as they're using the correct types of maps and things like that. So, so I mean, it's kind of, I mean, I guess from what I'm understanding, no matter what we do today, the legislation trumps us and it's kind of a moot point. Okay, thank you. And I, I was just informed that uh, the bill was signed today. So, uh, Senator Wilson. Well, that was one of the things I was going to say. It was signed this morning. And the other thing was, um, I think Todd mentioned that it was done all, all of a sudden, but this was introduced in January 
And it was uh, Kevin Vandeway, and he was the chair of that committee. So um, I don't think that it was rushed through. Kevin's had this on his mind for a while. So um, anyway, January 10th was when it was introduced. It was heard for the first time January 26th, and then we passed it on the 29th of, well, sorry, I guess after concurrence, it was March 7th, the last day of session. Thank you. Ty? Just to say that if the statute trumps, as Angela described, then somebody would have to articulate for me why we need to take, what's the value in us taking the proposed action? Because I would be inclined not to. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna jump on that because I want to react to that very quickly, if that's okay, uh, Dan. Go ahead. Yeah, please do. Yeah, so so I actually agree with Angela's assessment that the obviously the, the legislative directive, right, the the new statute, and it's a statute with an emergency clause, so it's a it's controlling law right now, um, has preclusive effects. So um, the WUI code, as adopted by uh, the the council, is no longer in effect because of the statute. But I want to consider it a best practice for the the council to allow. To, to not take action ref reflecting that through changing its codes and changing its wax uh, because of the confusion that that could potentially create in the field, uh, potential risk of litigation. If somebody has a theory as to, well, it's not fully preclusive and um, you know, then we're, we're found defending the codes potentially. Uh, if the assessment of this council is that the legislature uh, 6120 rather precludes the council from taking the steps it has taken to adopt a WUI code. And I think that's the right assessment. Then my recommendation would be to make that official and formal uh, and to uh, approve uh, the emergency rule. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Tom, go ahead. Well, yeah. Thanks. Dan. I was going to just say, you know, it's, I think it's time that this council starts listening to the people a little bit too. And, you know, it is very, very clear to me that there was overwhelming support that there may be some overreach um, based on the way things are currently written at the moment. Um, and that we need to pay attention to this. You know, we don't want to always be defending our actions. We want to do, you know, what's in support of the people um, and keeping them safe and, you know, and to some degree at their will too. So I just urge that we just pass this as a formality, if nothing else, that we are in support of the direction that the public has taken on this and that we move on. Thank you, Tom. Joe? Yeah, I think we can, we can groan about what we like or don't like about the legislation. It happened, it was unanimous, it is signed. We need to take this action. I don't see another alternative. And if we don't, we'll have codes on the books that are not legal. And I think that would create a lot of confusion. So um, I think we should, you know, we've, we've, we've said a lot of things today. I think we need to pass this. Thank you. Katie? I'll go ahead. Um, just, uh... I, I, I'm in favor of this as well. I just wanted to know, I mean, since we're, is, is um, filing the emergency rule easy for our staff? Like just knowing that we're trying to cut down on this stuff, like it, since it's a pretty simple strike through, is that, um, is that fair to stay, say Stoyan, or is this, you know, since it is kind of a, for show, I just wanted to ask that. What if you that see on the screen right now, this is how the emergency rule looks like. So we are striking uh, the existing language and we will reserve the section. So formally in the WAC, there will be a week code, but there won't be any text. Okay. Uh, just to show uh, what exactly the document looks, uh, how exactly the documents look like. So we are reserving these sections and we, we will get back to it when the maps are developed. Uh, so it's the emergency rule. We are ready to file it today. Uh, sooner is better. And, and do you mind if I jump in for a second, uh, Damon, just a follow-up question for Stoyan. I'm not used to asking questions, but I will this time. Uh, obviously, the emergency rule is only in effect for 
or up to 120 days. And so that would, would the plan also be to then? Yes, we will follow uh, up with, with offsite cover, yes. With offsite, with? Uh, expedited. Uh, uh, expedited through, sorry, expedited. because it's, it's a, it's a uh, uh, mandate uh, yeah. by the legislation. Okay, good. And that was a little bit of a leading question, so forgive me, but just for benefit of the council, if the legislature passes something which uh, removes authority from the agency uh, to take action, then uh, uh, expedited rulemaking is the solution to uh, uh, to make the permanent change to, to those rules. It, it will be the same as that we discussed for the barbecue. Uh, and, right. And so the emergency is, just, is the stopgap measure to... Yes, it buys us time because of the effective date that happens today during the council. Okay. Okay, Roger, I'm going to call on you, and then we've got a couple. Of yes, uh, and, and I'm fine moving my question down to other business, but uh, both item number, uh, what we talked about for the fire rule, and now we, we've today passed two emergency rules. Um, Senator Wilson is here. I believe it's her bill that changes how we can pass rules in the future. I would like to have a better understanding of what our what we can and can't do moving forward, assuming that legislation uh, gets signed and passed. So we can do that now, or Damon, if you want to wait, and that can be uh, other business towards the end of the day, that's fine. But you know how we pass these rules is changing uh, according to the legislation as well. So I want to know what what we can and can't do moving forward. Okay, Senator Wilson, if you want to uh, respond to that. Well, yeah, I was just going to say that's on number eight of the agenda, it looks to me, right? So approved okay. bills. Okay. okay. So, uh, and I may not be, a, I have an, another appointment probably during that time. Stoyan is very well versed on this. So um, I'll get back as soon as I can, but just that, letting you know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ray, then Micah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I kind of wanted to spin off a little bit of what Derek talked about. Um, I encourage the council to take some sort of action on this today. Um, that would give us as cities uh, more guidance. We've already written ordinances to adopt the WU code. So any kind of action would give us more clear guidance on the city level of getting rid of the ordinance or resolution. Thank you. Okay, Micah. Thanks everyone. And, uh, I agree that we definitely need to take action on this, as all of you know, being so involved in this and just coming off the council. So many people have reached out to me asking what's going to happen, what's going to happen in the interim. Um, so please take action on this emergency rule. It is needed for clarity to those counties and cities that are that are doing something already or, or needing to know which direction they're going. So and I appreciate uh, Representative Schmidt and Senator Wilson for for speaking out on these bills and and voting on them uh we look forward to working with them in the future and i especially want to thank senator wilson for her actions and standing up for other constitutional rights in our state um if you all haven't watched some of the videos of senator wilson doing so so i appreciate the time and uh, please support this emergency rule okay representative schmidt yeah um thank you mike i appreciate <clears throat> i appreciate your comments and I just wanted to say, and I know uh, Senator Wilson pointed this out when the bill was dropped and when it was passed, but I did want to say, because I, I, you know, and maybe I misinterpreted what people were saying, but as a legislator, um, I, I do research every bill that I read and we also, or excuse me, vote for. And we also, you know, spend quite a bit of time in caucus with our ranking members um, educating us on, on these bills before they come to the floor. So I just wanted to let you know that, that we're not passing or voting for something because it was suggested that we should. It's because we feel like it's the right thing to do. And based on the information that we've received from our constituents, that's the way they want us to vote. So I just wanted to make that clear. We're not just, you know, uh, quickly passing things through. Uh, we are really actually paying attention and uh, reading the bills. And I, again, want to thank um, Micah for uh, acknowledging that. Thank you. There's a motion on the table to uh, delete the 2021 WUI code. Um, seeing no further discussion, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? There was, I want to make sure that 
motion was stated and restated correctly because it is complicated. Um, can that can the motion we just voted on be restated so it's clear and because it is it is substantial. Okay. Would staff please uh, restate the motion? It should be the same as the barbecue. Uh, direct staff to file the emergency rule and follow up with expedite. Emergency rule to do what? With this emergency rule, we are deleting the 2021 we caught. The emergency rule is effective for 120 days. So next week, we will start with the expedite rule. We will follow up with the expedite rule to make the deletion uh, permanent. Okay. Um, Chell, do you need, do you need a revote after the restate? No, I just wanted for the record it to be clear what we were voting on. Okay, I, I didn't ask for that, but okay. I didn't ask were there any opposed. Okay, motion carries. Um, because we we did have the uh, the fire sprinkler presentation, and then I did not ask for uh, any other public comments. I'm going to back up to item four. Larry, did you have something you wanted to add? I don't see Larry. Is Larry still here? I don't see him in the attendees list. And just, I, you did call for him to uh, get extra comment hey, again at number four. He's here. He's here. Okay. Larry, 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 go ahead. I'll, I'll give you a moment. To okay. Comment. Okay. It's um, the reason why I didn't comment be, just for a few minutes here, because I wasn't able to click on the thing. Someone was holding me out. But anyway, um, I, I want you to know what I'm about to say. It's it. I I respect all you people, and I want you to know that um, I'm not going after anybody here. But I want you to know from the perspective that I was sitting in watching Judge Carol Murphy this last Friday, and um, I seen two blatant lies to Judge Murphy by your people that represented you, and the first one was that there was only a handful of people that was bringing this uh, uh, charges or opposition to this code. And the BIAW alone has hundreds to thousands of members. So when, when, you're, when your counsel said there's only a handful of people bringing this motion, that's a total lie, okay? And then the, the second thing that was what I consider a total lie and that was said to judge murphy was that this that this is only costing five hundred dollars to make this change and uh and then they represented uh northwest labs you use northwest labs to do this i i know myself in the commercial code that i showed you it was hundreds of thousands of dollars to make this change and there was well documentation doing it. And, and, I, and I don't know, maybe a tiny home, you might be able to do this for $500, but on an average, there's no way you can make this change for $500, okay? And then on top of it, then, then they presented, well, since it's only $500, you're gonna get $5,000 of, of, of cost savings back. Well. When it ain't five hundred dollars, when it is into the thousands of dollars, you're going to have a lot more costs, and then there isn't the payback that's stated by any stretch of the imagination. And then finally, I want you to know what just happened here. This week, there's been mass layoffs in our industry because of what has happened. So the builders that build homes over here, they've stopped doing the building because of the cost. And it's not $500. It's, it's, it's five, 10, $20,000. Okay. And, and, and people over here, and I don't know if you realize this, but Todd should, the people over here voted down the school levies because we can't afford anything anymore. 
okay? The people that live in my district barely can pay for what they got. And, and this is the first time in 50 years that we voted down the schools levies for new schools because people can't pay for this stuff anymore there aren't going to be any new homes hardly built anymore because we don't have the money to do that thank you thank you larry uh, moving on to item seven revisions to the 2024 code adoption schedule so i Let me okay. This is the revised uh, calendar. We asked for the revisions because we were late with uh, the uh, technical advisory groups. So we moved the schedule. Uh, we pushed like two months, it will be really tough. However, it will give us a little bit more time to evaluate the proposals and put the reports uh, together. And I know there were some concerns that this schedule doesn't match the ICC schedule, but the ICC schedule was completely changed. And even if we want, I don't, I'm not sure we can we can align with that. So this is the schedule that we developed again, includes the revisions. We have group one, group two, and the uh, uh, energy codes are kind of group 1.1 and group 2.1. So there will be a little, little off between the energy codes and the rest of the codes, but this is what we ended up with. If you, if you have questions, concerns, I'm, I'm here to answer your questions. Uh, do you uh, do you need any action by the council? Typically, we don't ask the council for specific action for the revisions. But if you uh, like the uh, schedule, we will appreciate if you formally approve it. Okay, uh, Todd. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Stoyan. Uh, I just want to reiterate for everyone on the call that if we do it this way, um, with the now the requirement, which I assume was signed, is now statute, that we um, we have two special things on our plate. We have one, the six-story single point access requirement uh, mandate to develop that in the IBC. So, and the second that just passed was to develop up to, I believe, six plexes uh, in the IRC. And we know that that's going to re require and trigger many things that are really just going to point to the IBC and the IFC and so forth. Right. It's, 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 but they will be referenced in the IRC, which was, was, I think kind of the legislative intent. I just want to clarify that those two efforts are special mandates and don't necessarily have to meet the schedule of group one and group two, because I think that would be very challenging, especially with that latter one I just mentioned between the IBC and the IRC. Thank okay. you. Thank you, uh, Ben. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify um, with Stoyan and staff on um, where we're putting the, the UPC in terms of grouping. Because I, I, I think um, after the last meeting or during the last meeting, I had emailed just pointing to the um, November 17th, 2023 meeting minutes where we, we had approved moving that to group one to align with the mechanical code as we now have a, a common MVP tag for those. You you have the UPC in group two because if we if we align the mechanical code and the plumbing code in group one, we, we won't be able to. Group one is really, really tough. And when you see the reason for group one and group two, group two, I mean, there are many reasons, but for staff, if we can have group one in one year and group two in, in the second year, it will work perfectly for staff because we will have the time to uh, prepare the documents and, and, and run the technical advisory group meetings and, 
uh, uh, receive the proposals. But you see that is the second COP cycle in a row that group one and group two will be overlapping. And because we are already three months late and we add another quote here, uh, staff won't be able to compete there. Okay, and yeah, understand. We had discussed that previously. I guess my my concern would be um, reaching quorum for the tags that are going to be addressing the plumbing code items potentially. Um, it may not, in fact, be an issue. So I, I guess like I'll I'll defer to staff on um, the workload allotments and if it uh, is still recommended to keep it in group two. So um, that that's fine and understandable from my perspective. Your concern is valid, but even if we have uh, a plumbing code in group one, we will have different meetings for the mechanical code and the plumbing code. So if we are experiencing issues with the quorum, they will be issues no matter what. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll um, reach out to you regarding scheduling okay. for the, the tag meetings and understand that better. Thank you. We we work very closely with uh, the technical advisor chair, so we don't put the schedule in the way we think is right. We we will coordinate with the technical advisor chair. Okay, thank you, uh, Tom. Yeah, I just got a real quick question. Uh, do you, I think you brought up some good points. I'm just kind of curious though, what the effects of that you see on this schedule to be? Is that a question for Ben. No, it was for Todd, based on his observations. Oh, you're referring to the to the special six story and then the six plex, right? The two. Um, just to clarify, the question was because those are are legislative mandates. Um, do we have to? I, I, my understanding is we have to complete those for this code cycle, right? They have to go into adoption and be implemented with the rest of this code in this code cycle. It's not clear to me, and it's not my opinion that it has to be group one, group two. I, th I think we have the ability to define when that happens. Perhaps it's the whole code cycle, right? It's both group one and group two, or we should complete it all in group one. We just haven't clarified that to my understanding. And it would be hard, in my opinion, to do them sequentially, especially the residential code one. Uh, but I'd love to hear other opinions. Yeah. We have not only two, we have five uh, mandates. Uh, so I want to add one that is very difficult because we have, uh, I would say, many stakeholders that will join in this and we have to consult with them. But this is the a uh, bill that was enacted last year for the emergency housing or emergency shelters. And we all already started working on it. And we have one more that is for uh, efficiency at dwelling units. And we have one more that was for uh, bottle filling stations. Yes. Uh, and uh, just, you know, already put the proposal together. So we want to align all these additional mandates with this schedule and uh, the, the code adoption cycle. However, we are prepared if we can't finish the work in group one, uh, we are prepared to continue uh, working on these specific proposals uh, in group two. Uh, during group two uh, adoption. Jill. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I guess I would let staff sort through all the legislation and figure out what a good proposed schedule is or, or a couple options and then bring it back to the council once those one once they have figured it out but I, I i guess i don't see that on this so i i would await staff's input before we uh, i guess i would just await staff's input and react to that on on all those side uh, or all those other legislative mandates or things we're supposed to do Thank you. When you see here, this this uh, sale, uh, this is the submission period for uh, Group One. So May twenty five, July twenty four, and it's important if we will get put proposals there. So uh, again, staff put together the bottle filling stations. So we are ready to continue with this schedule. 
uh, we are working on uh, the uh, emergency house. So I think we will be able to complete this proposal and make it make it available for our stakeholders. So we want to start following this schedule again for this main day. Uh, Dustin put together, and I think Todd, you, you have his uh, a document uh, for the single exits. Uh, so it, it depends. We Again, we want to align with this schedule, and this is why we just pushed it a few months to give more time for folks to prepare. And you see right here, we will have more time for the technical advisory groups to review proposals and, and for staff to review proposals. So this is why I'm saying the intent is uh, to align these additional statutory mandates with the schedule you see here. But uh, because we have several actions connected, so if we are late somewhere and we get stuck with something, then we are prepared to move the, you know, whatever mandate is to move it into group two uh, uh, adoption. Okay, Todd, then Micah. Yeah, and I think that's, I would just like to see a line that goes across group one and group two that leaves the flexibility because while I can see that, you know, like the single stair, we can do that as an appendix in the IBC. We, we've got to get it to the tag, both the IFC and the IBC tags and, and really shape this with our, our statewide experts, your technical experts, because I, I think we have an idea, but we, we don't know until we've opened it up to the public process. So, um, and, and then again, with the, with the IRC piece and all those other, you know, I just, I, I know of them, but it's hard to track all those five mandates and, and how they're going to fit in here. So I do just think they need to be a special consideration until we get into the tags and can shape it. Thanks. Good observation. Micah. Thank you. I, I agree with Todd on that. that. That definitely needs to be maybe be a separate line item for the legislative directives. Um, because there's no way we're going to get a single exit proposal or a six story allowance into the residential code in the next six weeks or the next, you know, whatever to meet the IBC deadline uh, that you have here on the screen. One of the things I want to point out, Stoyan mentioned that we could not align the groupings of the codes with ICC because they changed their process this year. I want to point out that process change is for the 2027 international codes, not the 2024. The SBCC should have had no problem in grouping the code proposals with the ICC 2024 code change proposal groupings. Uh, again, there was no change in the 2024. It was for the 2027, which they have started um, for those folks that are in, involved in the national level. I also have concerns, and maybe we can get a status report from staff on where they stand with the review of the significant changes. Because if we approve, or if you, not we, um, no longer on the council, if you approve this schedule currently, um, you would have to approve the tag makeup in, in, a, in a similar action today. And then that would allow the tag, oh, let's say six weeks, maybe it's eight weeks, to complete the significant changes and state amendment uh, review and then move into the proposed submissions from um, – whoever submits anything. So I, I guess I'd like to hear a status on those significant change reviews. I just think that maybe Stoyan uh, shifting that even further may be an action that needs to be taken today. Maybe you shift that uh, through June and then have the proposals open up in June uh, for submission and pushing that into June to August. I, I know that's pushing even further, but um, I don't think for many of the tags that they have gotten significant numbers of code change proposals to review. I, I'm not going to say that for the energy code, they get way too many, but um, I'm not sure that you need uh, four to five months in there for tag review of proposals. It may be better to front load the opportunity to, to submit proposals and uh, allow a little less time at, at the review phase. Thanks. It, it looks like a, uh... There's a staff action on draft report on significant changes uh, due next month. Uh, Stoyan, did you want to add anything to that? If we could, if we keep pushing, we will end up having group one and group two in 2025, and 
you know, I understand your needs and your concerns, but at the same time, I, I, I'm friendly asking you to understand my concerns because if we get two groups for a year, year and a half, we will fail. Uh, so what I'm trying, and Mike, I get your concern again. I understand it, and and you're right. It's it's tough, but at the same time, I I'm trying to make it work for everybody. And if if staff is not able to complete something, then it 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 defeats the purpose of making a different schedule. Okay, Roger. I'm, I have a comment and then I'm going to make a proposal. Um, my comment is, as we've talked about group one and group two for about the last four or six months, um, we've had a schedule that we've talked about that we first passed, I believe, in November. I, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we've had to make adjustments to that. I am with Stoyan. We need to make a decision and move forward. And um, some of these, uh, you know, the the yes some of these are challenging dates but if we don't move forward then the end date is going to be more challenging than anything so um my proposal is to accept the the to approve the uh schedule as issued um for, with the meeting minutes number one and number two, direct the staff to also create a schedule that integrates the five legislative mandates or six or however many we have and show us uh, how that workload will get integrated into this. Um, I do believe it has to be separate. So um, the second part of my proposal is to ask the staff to give us a schedule that shows us how we're going to integrate that work. Okay. Uh Stoyan, does that seem like a reasonable recommendation? So, again, I will I will repeat what, what I said. I will try to uh, say it better this time. You don't have the stat statutory mandates in a different schedule because we want to align with the train of code adoption cycle. And and uh, here is the first detail that I I I should have told you about it. So the residential code is in group two. So our assumption was that we will have more time to work on this uh, uh, middle housing or multiplex housing. We have several months because group two, we will formally start with group two in December, November, December uh, this year. But the real work will be uh, after January. So that's the most complicated. Uh, for the building code, we have uh, we have the and this is in question mark for the building code or residential code. We have the emergency housing. So the emergency housing will require us to develop appendix, and and my proposal for the council is to develop this appendix as part of the residential code. So we have enough time for this too. I want to. Uh, uh, run this off cycle of uh, this uh, statutory rules, statutory directed rules during the adoption process for uh, uh, group two. Uh, the uh, bottle filling station, we already have the proposal. It's, it's, it's already done. Uh, the single exit and uh, the, what was the other one? For the efficiency units, uh, the efficiency unit is easy for the single exit. We, we haven't started yet. So we have one that we haven't started yet for group one. If you want me to develop a different schedule for this, I can do that, but I, I'll try to align again with this group if, one. If, if I can respond, Stoyan, I understand that. My, my point is on the building code, for instance, there are many, many, many issues that we could be going through right now. Yes, we have to integrate the middle housing into the building code. I understand that. But it doesn't make sense for us, for me, to sit here and wait to figure out how we're going to do that while we have a whole lot of other stuff that we could start going through and, and understanding and approving. So I will qualify. Um, a, my request, the second part of my motion, um, is to ask you how we can integrate those five legislative into our code. But I want us to get started on the tag review process for everything else so that we can move forward. 
Todd, or excuse me, Tom. Yeah, I'd be inclined to second that motion, but I want to follow up with a question um, on these dates here. Are these uh, guidelines, targets, or deadlines? And I'm sorry if that's naive. Well, Tom, I, I, I will respond a little bit. I think for the public, the public needs to know these dates for the submission period to propose state amendments. We need to issue that to the public. They need to know when they can and, and what the deadline is for them to get proposed amendments in. And that's why I think it's imperative for us to publish this, submit it. And yes, we are gonna have to integrate the middle housing and those other legislative mandates um, into the code at some point in the next three years. But for all of the other stuff, we need to pass this. We need to say, this is our agenda. The public needs to know, here's when you could submit proposed amendments. Um, that's why I feel like we need to pass this and then ask the, the staff to integrate how they're gonna integrate the mandates into our schedule. So Roger, are you uh, changing this from a recommendation to a motion? Uh, I'm sorry, yes. If, if my verbiage was incorrect, Damon, I had meant this to be a motion okay. that we approve this schedule and that we request the, the staff to integrate the five mandates from the legislature into our code adoption process. And under so those, that's my motion. Okay. And Tom, if you understood it as a motion, did I hear a second? Yes, that's how I understood it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Micah? Thanks for affording me another opportunity to public comment after the motion. I agree with uh, the motion, and it needs to occur that we need to have the schedule out there and going. Um, if you all remember those that participated in the legislative committee, I asked this specific question at the legislative committee. If the legislative mandates would be tied to our code adoption schedule? The answer was no. And the answer was from Derek was no, it would not. So that's why I agree that we need a separate line item or the SBCC needs a separate line item that shows the integration of those legislative items within the two year cycle, not um, assuming that they will fall within the dates here. Um, and that was a request at the a legislative council meeting and it was questioned and answered that they would not have to fall within that same timeline of specific dates. However, it would fall within the timeline to implement those into the 2024 codes. So uh, I agree with the motion and the need for the separate lines. Thanks. Looking forward to this schedule. Thank you. Joe? Yeah, I agree with the motion as well. And yeah, I think we just need to move forward. Okay, Don? Thank you. Yep. Uh, we, we can do it. And let's just... Let's just get going. I think the ask there then is to um, make sure everyone understands that we have to get certain things done before we would lock, you know, the adoption and for the, for the group one in, in December or whenever that's scheduled here. Um, and then make sure that everything is in the right place so that if there are additional amendments that they're in appendices or something that they can still be open in group two. But we, we can do it. And I agree with with the motion. Let's let's move forward. Okay. Uh, Roger, do you want to restate your motion just for clarity? Yeah, <clears throat> my motion is to approve the uh, schedule as presented and ask the staff to integrate the procedures for adopting the five mandates mandates into our schedule and present that to us in the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, seeing no hands up, no further comment. Uh, all in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, let's go ahead and take a brief break. It is 11.54 by my computer. Let's uh, go ahead and break till 12.10. Okay, I'm going to call the meeting back to order. Uh, can we do a quick roll call to be sure everyone's back? Could staff do a roll call, please? All right. 
Chael Anderson. Present. Jay Arnold. Here. Todd Byruther. Here. Justin Borgo. Here. Damon Doyle. Here. Tom Handy. Here. Angela Hopped. Roger Haringa. Here. Matthew Hepner. Craig Holt. Ty Menzer. Here. Ben Omura. Here. Pete Rickey. Yeah, I'm here, but I will have to leave about one o'clock. Katie Sheehan. Here. Lauren Lothrop. Senator John Levick. Representative Alex Rummel. Representative uh, Suzanne Schmidt. Oops, here. Senator Linda Wilson. Assistant Attorney General, uh, dear Mayor Bachtel. I'm here. It appears we have a quorum. And Angela Haupt, I am here now. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to agenda item number eight, legislative committee report. Uh, Todd. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so we're done, uh, which is <laughs> everyone I think think is, is fully aware. Uh, session's over, and so we can review a couple of these bills. But I, you know, a um, couple of things. Thank you, everyone. Um, Thank you for, you know, it's, it's it's a little bit of a sprint and the legislators know that well. Thank you to our legislators, our liaisons, our ex officios here. Uh, congratulations. And 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 we're also very, very appreciative of your representation for us in, in the legislature. Um, I guess I'll, on that note, I also want to congratulate and thank uh, Senator Wilson. I don't see her on here now, but, you know, in her announcement of, of retiring and, and thank you for your service. Um, one thing I, so I, we voted in January, and we're going to hand this off now. And Tom, thank you for stepping up you, to take over the legislative um, committee. Uh, before we get into the bills, I just want to kind of frame this a little bit. What we agreed to was that um, we think the transition should happen now, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what we voted on. Um, so this will be my kind of last statement. And then uh, in that, there's there's a discussion about that we think we believe as a committee that the council should have. have um, very soon, maybe not today, but we should have this in a, in a very near meeting before we get closer to the legislative session next year. And and I think the WUI code was kind of representative of, of the challenges we have if we don't um, clearly define that authority and start this committee early in session. When I made a statement today about the WUI code, I wasn't talking about merit. We, we said um, the legislature did go through, as Senator Wilson explained, that obviously that bill started very early we didn't have any authority to in properly inform or in this case where the council did take a rare um, action to to in, to um, take a position. Um, it, it's an example of a complex bill where, where there was, everyone had support, including the commit, the, the council on the mapping need, which is, is the main th reason that bill passed. But the part that was a little less, um, that we could have informed a lot more with the legislators was um, the discussion between doing co-development in the political realm versus the technical realm, policy making versus rulemaking. And that's the part that kind of came to the last minute. And so um, I'm just going to use as an example, not to reiterate or relitigate or so forth, but to use that as, as why we, we, we want to have this discussion um, in the very near future about what the role of the legislative committee is. So with that, Stoyan, are is there anything you'd like to any summaries you'd like to give on on the bills as they as they pass and now they, they move in a statute? We started with more than 60 bills. Uh, 14 made it through. Uh, four of them were with a high priority. Uh, 2071 here is the bill that gives us, you know, two mandates, the uh, middle housing and the efficiency units. 6120 was discussed, and I will uh, uh, follow up on uh, Todd's uh, uh, statements that 
if the ledge committee doesn't have any authority to act in behalf of the council, sometimes it puts me or whoever the managing director is in a in a bad position. And 6120 is a good example because uh, the sponsor of the bill reached out and I, I it was Sunday and I didn't have any mandate from the council. The ledge committee didn't, want, didn't have any authority to vote on something and next day was Monday and it was a holiday, so I wasn't able to uh, schedule a special meeting. And so uh, the council's concerns were introduced, but it was too late in the game, especially in a short session. So uh, again, I will uh, agree with uh, uh, the committee and uh, thought that you know the council may want to think about. Uh, uh, giving authority to the ledge committee to act in, in behalf of the council. And uh, I want to thank Todd, uh, and uh, it was a pleasure working with you as a uh, ledge committee chair, and uh, uh, I, I appreciate your help on this bill. So uh, there was a question about uh, uh, Senate Bill 6291, and uh, I want to Thank Senator Wilson and uh, Representative Rommel. Uh, uh, if you remember, uh, Representative Rommel also introduced a bill uh, uh, in the House and they worked together uh, on this bill. And uh, again, it wasn't my bill. I helped, but it wasn't my bill. And uh, they proved that, you know, the council can do a, a, a better job agreeing on things. There was a question about the, the uh, uh, emergency rules. The only change with the emergency rule is that the council will need two-thirds vote uh, to approve or agree whether or not this emergency rule meets the criteria for emergency rules. Everything else is the same. So now we need majority to uh, approve the emergency and to approve the language. And with the new bill, when it's effective, uh, we will need two thirds to approve the emergency and and uh, a simple majority to approve the language. That's the only difference for the emergency. Uh, something else that we missed, and uh, I was uh, uh, planning to talk about it, and also Roger, Roger saw it. Thank you, Roger. Uh, and it's very important, and it was somehow. Uh, it's part of the budget, okay? So DS missed it, I missed it, and I saw it about a week ago, even less than that. So $250,000, this is item 50, starts here. Uh, $250,000, the climate commitment account, state appropriation, this is for the State Building Code Council, uh, to conduct a study, and these are the details about the study. A review of the language addressing embodied carbon mm -hmm. building codes of other jurisdictions, including but not limited to California and uh, Vancouver uh, building by, by law, and there are some other provisions here, but that's the important one. Uh, first, December 1st is the due date, and second, the funding is not guaranteed, and I highlighted that in uh, GES in behalf of the State Building Code Council submitted uh, uh, how it's called officially a letter of concern that we raised this concern about the funding and about uh, the time, and we raised the concern that it was approved with the budget and we didn't have any idea. Uh, again, I learned that a few days ago. So this is all I can I can say. Uh, further in the budget, uh, we have uh, uh, hundred eighty thousand dollars. This is uh, twenty seventy one. The house built uh, twenty seventy one. We have hundred eighty thousand dollars for uh, working on this uh, middle housing uh, bill, and uh, I am planning to hire a person in a limited term if I can. If I'm lucky to find somebody to agree on that, but 
I'm not even close to uh, get to the advertisement yet. I have a question for the highlighted section. Um, if the general election is in November and the report is due in December, it doesn't seem to really, um, I guess I have, I have questions about, about that. That was the biggest concern because in order to uh, comply with the December 1st date, we need to start now which means we need to start looking for a third party to do this uh, uh, research. And the bidding process takes between three and six months, I was told, and preparing documents and everything. So if we try to comply with it, we have to pay somebody and then we may lose the funding in November, which will uh, give me a really hard time to find money to pay for this uh, work that is third party. Uh, again, we are uh, kind of speculating here, but uh, this is the concern that we we uh, send out. And I don't have the answer how, how we can do it yet. Roger. Yeah, and um, maybe Representative Schmidt can fill us in. I'm, I, I'm pretty ignorant about appropriation of money, the timing of appropriation mm -hmm. of money and um, you know, what, what dollars come from where and when you yeah. have them available to you. And, uh, and yeah, I would like to actually, I'm going to, because that's what I had a question right away about this, because first of all, the initiative, if it passes in November, doesn't, it's, it's not retroactive. So the money that's already been collected through the cap and trade is is collected, and we have between 1.2 billion, 1.7 billion. So if this money was appropriated out of the out of the CCA funds, then it should be there. It's not we're not going retroactive. So this comment on here really throw kind of throws me off because that seems to be the money should be there because it's already been appropriated, and again, yeah, and I say that may not be used for this purpose, um, but. Again, the initiative would if it if it's voted in in November, the money it isn't retroactive, so there's still money there in 2024. Uh, so what I guess I would have to say is I'm going to go to uh, the uh, uh, I can't think OPR and ask them um, this question because that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, can I can I jump in for a minute here and just offer my thought for whatever it's worth? Uh, I'm I'm with Representative Schmidt is trying to kind of puzzle a little bit about this. One thing to keep in mind in with respect to state um, expenditures of funds is we're constitutionally prohibited from expending funds until um, there's a deliverable. So uh, I think one way of reading this would be: Hey, if the report is delivered by whoever it is we contract with to deliver the report, and that happens December fifteenth then I think some could read this as saying, well, you you have to pay for it. You just can't pay for it from this specific fund. And that's pre that's actually pretty concerning because the likelihood of the heavy lifting on a report of this is probably going to happen after the November election. That makes sense. I get that. Okay. So I will, I will just, I mean, that helps a little, well, helps a little bit, <laughs> although it's still confusing. What can we do or how can we move forward? And I, I'm not hearing that there is a clear path. Um, I, I do just want to say, I think this is a very, very important topic for us to address. And um, so if there is a uh, committee to, that we develop to help with this process, I'd be happy to be a part of it. Um, so I think it's very important that certainly the money part we need to figure out how that how that flows and when we can get started. So, yeah, also interested in in helping out, but I guess if if it's due December one, then almost all the work would happen before November the November election, presumably. So, yeah, um, I look forward to what people find out, uh, Representative Schmidt and others. Okay, Todd. 
God, you're muted. Well, that will help. Um, thank you, Chair. So just a question, where, where do we see this fits in existing structure? Is, is it a is it a tag that would, would help look into embodied carbon? And, and we've never addressed this before. It's been proposed in the building code, but I'm just curious what our thoughts are, how we would do this. Yeah, I, I would presume perhaps a task force. But... Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just opening the question up. Sure. Ben? Uh, if I can, I've been I've been following this a little bit over the last month or so, and and that is what I had assumed is there would be a task force of the SBCC, along with potentially hiring somebody to do the work of that's you know reviewing the the Cal Green requirements and that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, ben, Our initial intent was a third party that we can contract out with. Yeah, I just want to say I'll, I'll put myself in there as well to assist from the council side um, as needed. Okay. Tom? Yeah, ditto for me too. I'd be happy to help. Okay. Just go ahead. I presume you're taking uh, a list of names here. Uh, you have no idea how happy I am to uh, understand that we'll get help on that. So, uh, we need a little bit more time to figure out what is going to happen with this funding and then for sure I will reach out to you because especially if we need to keep the uh, the due date in December 1st, we need to start now. Okay. Chair, since I represent materials, I better put my name in. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, are there any other comments on uh, the Legislative Committee report? Roger? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I will leave this after I make one more comment. I, Stoyan, I think we need to have a plan going forward for the April meeting. And if we don't have anybody hired at that point, at least we need to get the ta a task force together to see what we can do and accomplish by then, um, you know, yeah. so. Can I can I jump in for just a real second, just to respond real quick to Roger's point? You know, the, the budget doesn't go into effect until July first, right? Uh, and so the money would not be available until then. Uh, you, that doesn't preclude you all, though, from moving forward to get to start the RFP process to find a consultant if that's appropriate. So certainly, I'd recommend going that route. Uh, but the likelihood of actually set, having somebody on board and ready to start paying before the July first is um, probably not going to not going to work. Uh I will only add, Derek, all of our time <clears throat> is free to the state. So if I've we have that. a course that is, that is formed and we start formulating some of the concepts and where we might go, that can happen before July 1st. Oh, to be sure. And and I want to be clear about that. Yeah, Nothing precludes you from doing any of that work now. It's just the actual yeah. paying of the consultants is going to have to wait. Yep. Okay, Jay. From our uh, previous discussion on on the Wooly Code and our ability not to um, uh, to to respond with the authority of the full State Building Code Council impacted our um, ability on that bill. There was a lot of discussion within the Legislative Committee about how to how to deal with this in the future, and I'm wondering if, as a council, we can direct the Legislative Committee to start working on a legislative agenda that the full building code council could adopt that would give some direction for the uh, committee to move forward um, both during session and during the interim. We've identified some flaws with 6120 that we'd like to fix in the trailer bill. And um, I, I think that a, um, I, I think that work should begin as, as soon as we can uh, to be able to be successful in getting what we want um, for um, uh, fixing the uh, authority and the ability to have a Washington specific Wooly code. Yeah. Tom? Yeah, Jay, you, you beat me to the punch, but I'm glad you did, you know, because I think it's real important that we just get right started on this. You know, we figure out what, what direction the, uh, legislative committee will have the authority to take on things, you know, figure out our priorities and maybe a few of us can get together, you know, in the interim and 
and try and put a framework around that. You know, I know that the cities and the counties and, you know, almost everybody has legislative committees that have the authority to act on behalf of the body. And we need to take what works for them and how it can adopt be adopted um, to the, you know, to the council so that we don't end up getting stymied, you know, like we were last session in any search session. So I don't think we need to um, go out there and be a, a lobbying group, but I do think we need to bring forward our, our concerns about certain things as they come up that that might affect how we can operate as a, an effective body. So, Okay, thank you. Roger? I completely agree, and I would have one more ask maybe for the committee, and that is uh, there are how many 12 bills on the list or something? And some of them are monitoring and low, but a summary now that these are passed, now that we know what's in place, a summary of, okay, here's the impacts to the SBCC. Um, that would be very helpful for all of us, I believe. Okay, thank you. Jay? Uh, given all that, I'd like to move that the SBCC direct the legislative committee to come back with a proposed legislative agenda at a future meeting and also provide the um, summary of information that Roger had asked for on uh, bills that had passed and impact the SBCC. I'll second that. Okay, uh, there's a motion and a second, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, hey. Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Tom, as an incoming chair of the committee next year, do you got any uh, introductory comments you want to make? Or no, not not any more than I've kind of already said. Uh, other, you know, I think, like I said, it's it's real important that we we kind of engage in. You know, you know, getting together and and establishing priorities as early as possible. I would suggest that you know, in response to what we had just voted on, that that maybe by June and before we kind of take a month or two off during summer, we have we have a outline to present, um, and that will give us enough time to kind of digest what's what's happening now. You know, and um, and also, of course, carry on with our our day jobs. <laughs> yeah. You know, but but still have something meaningful to come back to the council with. Okay. So, wonderful. Uh, Representative Schmidt. Yeah, I was just going to say, suggesting as a legislature legislator that um, that you do, you know, have the meeting and that you come up with ideas. And actually, we start really working on writing bills and getting ready to, you know, submit them, you know, September, October. So I would say, you know, if you could have a list of things or the way that you would, you know, what what you would like to work on um, and then, you know, get a hold of, you know, whatever representative you want that's going to sponsor that bill. But I'd say that that really November, December is too late. Um, that's that's really that's kind of like then we're going to scramble to get a bill together and to work it with you know, stakeholders and also to get it non, um, nonpartisan, that, that's really a little bit late. So we really need like September, October, so that, like I said, we can start working. And, and I think that, you know, we, I'm sure, I, I guess, uh, Representative Bramall, I don't see him still on here, but I know uh, Senator um, Wilson, that if we, I'm, I certainly don't have sponsor the bills or need to or be involved, but I'm just saying that if I were, that I would want to have that bill ready by September or October so that I could start getting, you know, like a, a bipartisan co-sponsor and then start working with um, stakeholders. Good information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, moving on to our next agenda item, item number nine, appointment of TAG members. Uh, Stoyan, take it away. Before, uh, well, while Rosanna is putting uh, this on the screen, uh, <clears throat> first I want to apologize. I didn't send you the resumes. I didn't even think about it because in the past we we haven't done that. And uh, uh, my intent for this meeting was to show you what you have, what we have so far, and we are still receiving uh, uh, applications and resumes. Although this is uh, after the. Uh, uh, 
March 8 date, that was the, the, the closing date. But I, I want to propose two options for the council. And uh, uh, I think yesterday I, I sent to you some potential upgrades to the bylaws, uh, which you don't need necessarily to vote on this if you disagree, but for staff purposes, if the council wants to uh, discuss the and, and uh, appoint TAC members during this meeting, that, that's great. Uh, the second option that we see is the council to decide uh, and uh, give the authority to a person or a committee or you know, whatever the council decides and staff will work with this committee to uh, help with approving uh, the technical advisory group members. And uh, there are a few criteria that we were planning to propose a complete technical advisory group membership. And we didn't do it because there were some important criteria that uh, uh, I wasn't sure if, if the council will would allow me to do that. What are the criteria? First, we have in the bylaws that a TAC member can be appointed for three years and then for additional three years, that's it. Uh, there were several discussions about changing it to one code adoption cycle uh, and reappointed for another code adoption cycle. Uh, my question for the council, and I have this in the document that I sent you yesterday, my question for the council is, do you want to keep it or you, you want to you wanna change it? Uh, and again, the language that I sent you, and I can show it here if you ask me to do it, I, I, I'll be happy to do it. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I want to ask the council, we don't have this in the bylaws, uh, a technical advisor, a person applying for a technical advisory group C. How many technical advisory groups one person can serve one, two, uh, unlimited. This is this is what we don't know. So that's that's the second uh, important part. The third important part is we are asking for recommendation. So for some technical advisor group members or candidates, we have recommendations for other for for others we don't. And uh, speaking as a, a council staff. Everybody that submitted applications, every, everybody seems qualified, uh, technically knowledgeable to serve in the technical advisory group. But if we establish the criteria, then this will be easier for the council, for staff, or for committee, or whatever entity is appointing uh, uh, these uh, TAC members. The last one that I want to uh, uh, outline, there was a heated discussion about uh, combining some technical advisory group seats. For example, uh, building officials and cities and counties. Uh, we don't have very many applications from folks that want to represent cities and counties. We have requests from building officials who want to represent cities and counties. So my question for the council is, if we don't have uh, uh, a person that is willing to uh, serve in a particular position, do we want to appoint whoever else or we want to keep this seat empty until we find the right person for, for this seat? Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, Lauren, our ex-officio from LNI, I think uh, he suggested that LNI is keeping the seats uh, uh, empty and not just appointing uh, whoever, right? This is all I want to say for this. Okay. <clears throat> so you've got, you got a lot, lot to cover there. Um, and I see a lot of hands up. One of, the, one of the things, I mean, we need representation, right? And uh, I'm disappointed looking at this very first list because I know I, I know three people that I could fill in for home builder, residential HVAC, uh, subject matter expert, even educator. So um, I would like to see us extend the uh, availability of 
people to apply for the tag. Um, you know, right? If we could even have the tag in progress and still be filling slots, it's the most important thing is that we have good SMEs on these tags. So um, hopefully somebody would be willing to make a motion to that effect. Um, let's go ahead and start with Tom. Yeah, I, I raised my hand kind of early just based on pretty much the first thing that Swain said. I was a little bit confused. We were talking about, you know, two, three-year periods or two code adoption cycles and differentiating between. Is that Was that it, uh, you know, so that somebody might, if somebody got in midway through an adoption cycle that their three years wouldn't be up? Or, or I guess I'm curious what you're trying to clarify there. Yeah, and, and if I can jump in really quick, uh, you know, the code adoption cycle is three years. So exactly. I, think, I think by clarifying code adoption cycle, that way somebody works through a whole cycle of code rather than just saying three years, which could be midway to midway, right? So I I would lean toward code adoption cycle myself. Yeah, so no, I agree with that. I totally agree with that, you know, and I'd also agree with you on on um, keeping these positions open, you know, as the tags get moving. Now they people that do join too late, you know, are going to have a lot of catching up to do. But but I think having their perspectives on things, you know, really adds a lot to it. And we spent a lot of time debating, you know, what types of people would be, you know, would be best to have in those positions and I, I think we shouldn't vary from that much if if we can help it. So. Right. Can we uh could we handle these business items one at a time? So uh, Tom, would you be willing to make a motion to either of those two items? I would I'd be willing to make a motion to both that we okay. keep these uh seats open until filled and that the terms of office are based around code adoption cycles. Um, and that they can uh, be appointed for one and then uh, one after that. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? Go ahead and just jump in if anybody would like to second. Jay? I'll second that. Thank you. Okay, so there's a motion on the table. Chell, go ahead. Yeah, so historically, we've done that tag appointments vastly differently than we will this time. Historically, it's always been a rolling clock, and people just, as they apply, they're appointed if nobody is in that position. And in order for somebody to leave the tag, they we've usually made them find some sucker to take over for them because <laughs> it's historically very difficult to find anybody who's willing to go to all these meetings and show up um so yeah and, and like as the chair of the energy code tags i basically whoever the person who is leaving has a has suggested i've reached out to and if they're willing then they they join the tag this is a vastly different process this year so um <clears throat> but i agree completely with it should be open until filled and if it's not filled then it's open inherently and i don't know that yeah i i guess i support the motion i don't know that's necessary but I support that it's open until filled. Um, I think the reason why we did it this way, this time with a 30 day window was just so that we knew we needed to appoint people by X date. So we needed all the resumes by X date. So I think that's that's my understanding of why we did it. Um, and we need to now appoint people like that. I um, So I agree with you both on that, Tom and Damon on that. <clears throat> okay. It, overall, I think priority should go to those who have recommendations from larger trade organizations, or or to the extent that there is a an entity that that is a known and, and recognized overarching trade organization. I, th I think priority should go slightly to in that direction, and I think people who are political strategists should be deprioritized because um, what we're hoping for is sound technical advice, not uh political stuff um i think yeah being part of two adoption cycles is is good um i don't think we need to limit people explicitly to a number of tags i think 
<clears throat> the tag chairs can figure out if, if somebody applied for 16 tags um, that maybe they shouldn't be appointed to those. I, I feel like the tag chairs can make reasoned judgments based on that. Um, you know, we could have a guideline of two or three max, perhaps. Um, we do have people that take over mid-cycle. Um, and so I'm I'm guessing I'm leaning towards, you know, limiting people to two full cycles or two full three-year code adoption periods um, for being an appointed member of the TAG. So th those are my thoughts. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Todd, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, agree with with Shell, and I, I'm not concerned personally if someone wants to serve on multiple tags. I think it actually brings continuity, and and since they're often staggered, it's 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 also um, reasonable. Um, we I would like um, to review these um, these applications, perhaps as the committee chairs or and vice chairs. Maybe it's our executive committee, which is already made up of our our. our our chairs, you know, we haven't done that in the past, but uh, we've, it's been more of a discussion between the chair and, and the executive director. Of course, the executive director is part of the executive committee, so that that also would be appropriate. So I just want to put that out there that I would like us to get together, talk about these applicants, and more importantly, talk about um, how we might have a recruitment strategy to properly fill fill all these out together. Right. Thanks. I agree, one hundred percent, Roger. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have a number of comments. I, I kind of feel like I'm taking Micah's position here on the council and <laughs> opinion on everything. Um, There's our grown a beard. Really. So, <laughs> so um, you know, I, I completely agree with uh, with tying the tags to a, a code cycle, and that's even if somebody leaves and we have somebody fill this position, they would fill it for the rest of that code cycle. That's that's my opinion. So having it tied each tag. So this would be the tag for the 2024 building code. Um, um, I am. I think it's completely fine to have people on multiple tags. In fact, there are subject matter experts that fire and building code are very integrated. There's going to be cases where that is very, very beneficial to have people on multiple tags. So, and then the other thing I keep. What I feel like we're doing is, is we're trying to legislate exactly this is how we're filling the tags. And ultimately, there's a lot of oversight that we have by, you know, having the chairs or as Todd said, the legislative committee reviewing who gets, who gets, um, you know, who's appointed, um, that there's plenty of oversight, in my opinion, as far as, um, you know, somebody that's there too long. I actually don't care if they're two code cycles. It's like, if you don't have anybody else have them for the third code cycle. I don't see a problem with that. We have enough oversight to say, hey, you've been on this for two cycles and we've got another person. Um, so I, 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 you know, I don't like limiting it to two necessarily, but I support everything else uh, on the proposal. I would on the, um, and, and I will support it. Um, and then I also think, Damon, we have, you mentioned it. I completely agree. We need somehow like we have you know we've we've opened this up to the public in fact i even pulled out some language from uh, senator wilson's um bill that passed uh you know we've we've sent it on the website informing the stakeholders and members of the public that these positions are open we've had that open for a month now or something like that and i'm still i'm i'm with damon the building code counts building code tag there i think we seven people or seven positions filled out of 15 and don't have an architect. And I have a whole lot of architects I could reach out to and say, hey, this position's open. We need support. We need uh, somebody to fill it. So um, I think that it needs to be understood. All right. If it's not filled, I like that we gave the public first pass at it. But now if it's not filled, anybody can go out and recruit. Let's get somebody, you know, somebody who's interested and, and will be committed to, to helping us work through the tag. So those are my comments. Thank you, Roger. Those are valuable. And just to remind the, the council, the motion passed previously was to limit our tags to 15. Those The names in red are kind of alternate positions if we didn't fill positions above, so they can be slipped in there. Um, so that, that's how I understood what we passed previously. Uh, Jay? Yeah, some feedback on, on the process. 
uh, as we go through to appoint it. Um, echoing some of what we've heard, I, I do generally uh, would accept the recommendations for from the statewide organizations when we have specific yeah. slots like uh, fire marshals or architects or utilities where where the particular trade association for that is making those recommendations. I definitely would lean towards those. Um, I do like the idea of having the executive committee uh, coordinate across tags. We've had a number of people apply for a number of positions and to be able to, to uh, balance those instead of um, across tags, instead of chairs making individual decisions, I think that needs to be uh, coordinated. Um, I uh, want to be careful about stacking when defined positions exist. For example, we have some cases where um, uh, fire marshals are applying for city and county slots when there already is a fire marshal slot elsewhere in there. Uh, same with utilities and engineers. Um, I think we need to make sure that if if a particular stakeholder already has a defined slot that we're not stacking in other slots. Again, that's something I think can be worked out with the executive committee review. And um, also I would generally support uh, reappointing previous uh, TAG members that have gone through one cycle to bring that experience to the ne next cycle, unless we got feedback from staff or the tag chair that their their previous participation was uh, lacking or not uh, constructive. Um, and again, uh, I think we'll discuss this further, but the executive committee, I think, is the right mix with committee chairs and tag chairs and officers to kind of shape this and whether this the SBCC says the executive committee can appoint or the executive committee recommends a slate that the SBCC appoints. Um, I, th I think that having the executive committee involved is the right way to, to make these decisions when we've got a bunch of competitive seats. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chell, and I'll just remind everybody we have a motion on the table at the moment, and I want to come back and address the other points that Stoya brought up as well. So, Chell, go ahead. I think to, to our earlier discussions today about schedule, I think getting people appointed quickly is important. They've been waiting uh, for a while. They've Many of them applied by the original deadline, which was <clears throat> the end of last month. Um, I think it would be perfectly fine to have the, count, uh, the committee chairs do the appointments. Um, that's we've done in the past with the mm -hmm. tag chairs or committee chairs doing the appointments. I think that's perfectly fine. It takes a long time to wade through all the resumes. Um, and I think for an executive committee to wade through the, I don't know, 60 or 80 or 100 resumes, that would take some time. So I guess I would just rather make it a little easier. Um, if you'd rather go to the executive committee, that's fine, but I would rather make it um, optional to go to the executive committee. Um, and then I just wanted to also say that we did have people join the tag, the energy code tags, just for the EPCA uh, thing. So they serve for a few months out of the cycle. So I want to make it, I want to make sure we don't limit people too much to you know, serving parts of two cycles. Um, and I think, I, I can't remember the bylaws suggestions that were sent, but I think they said uh, limited to two cycles, but if nobody else applies, then they could be appointed again. Um, something like that. And I'm trying to remember where I saw that. I just sort of looking for it and I didn't see it immediately. Um, but I like that idea as well, because in some cases you have people that are just great at, at voicing um, solid opinions and um, and they're willing and able to show up at tech meetings. And I I can just say that I appreciate that because um, there's nothing worse than, than showing up to a tag meeting and not having enough enough of the people that said they'd show up actually show up to have a discussion on something. So I'm I'm in support of, um, <clears throat> I'd like, so a motion was made for two things and I guess I don't, I need to rehear exactly what the wording was uh, before I decide if I support them or not. Um, but I do like the, the bylaws suggestions um, that are in front of us right now. Okay, we're getting out of the weeds here. Uh, the motion right now is to clarify that 
Tag appointments are for two code cycles, not two three-year terms. And also that we leave the uh, the, the uh, tag volunteer ability open and, and not and not close it out. Is that correct, Tom? Yeah, the positions are open until filled. Okay, perfect. And and I, I I'm still not clear on what the 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 first motion was about limiting to two cycles because. Um, I, I guess I just want to be abundantly clear on that because that would affect a lot of people on the, the energy code tag, for example. So, Chell, if you'll read the second, the first sentence in the second paragraph in number three, this is how it exists today. Yep. Okay. So we're just we're just changing it from a three year term to a triennial code adoption cycle. We're just clarifying that it's a cycle, not just simply three years. Okay. Okay. So the 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 motion has nothing beyond that regarding okay. limiting to two cycles. Okay. That's that's clear. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Todd, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Shell. Yeah. The the proposal for the executive committee. I the, the, each chair of each tag still reviews all of the all of the ap applications. In my opinion, you, you're supposed to be the subject matter expert. You're trying to form a you know a a group, right? But then that would, you would present that and, and and discuss that in the executive committee so that we can try to find consistency. We can kind of find a common strategy for recruitment. That's that's really the intent and bring it to one more level where Lisa's debated among the, the, the multiple chairs. Yes. That was my intent. Okay. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I suggest that maybe we take, call a question on this and clear up these two items and then we can move on to the discussion that's taking place on others. Okay. Uh, there's been a motion call for the question. Is there a second? Ben, did you want to second that or are you raising it for something else? Uh, maybe I just wanted to clarify the motion on the table um, with Tom. Are, are you including the highlighted portion for um, allowing um, tag members who have served previous terms to be appointed if there's no qualified applicants after 30 days as written here? I guess I wasn't ref referencing anything in particular. Um, if that is the language that's currently there, I'm not sure that I address it. Are you talking about what's in the middle? Yeah, that, yes. that, like, that language is proposed. Let's let's uh there's been a motion to, to call the question on the previous just to dispose of that business. Is there a second for that? Okay, hearing that we'll continue with discussion. Uh either one of you can certainly amend the motion to include this language as well, or we can address it after we vote on the previous question. You know, reading this, I th I th you know, the only thing that I didn't consider on my motion was they could be reappointed for a third code adoption cycle. Um, I wouldn't have any problem with that necessarily, you know, if there are no other applicants available. Okay. So that's an amendment to the motion. Uh, Jay, you were the second. Does that fine with you as well? Yes. Okay. So the motion on the table is to... We're going to clarify a triennial code adoption cycle as opposed to three-year term. Uh, we're going to keep the uh, volunteer position for tags open, and we're going to uh, include the language when there are no qualified applicants for a specific stakeholder group following the 30-day advertisement available tag position. Current or previous tag members may be reappointed for a third code adoption cycle on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, Ken, you've had your hand up for some time. Go ahead. Yeah, I just didn't know if you guys were accepting public comment or not on this. Are you? I believe it is on the agenda as, as public comment. Yes. <laughs> I just thought it was going to happen before you guys made all your motions <laughs> in seconds and got ready to discuss. Um, uh, just a clarification. I I think that you're not limited to just two code cycles. I personally don't think it should be limited to any number of code cycles if each tag member is reapplying each time um and and then if they're qualified great if there's somebody else qualified fantastic and then maybe you put them in primary and the person that served a few terms um, could be an alternate to to help um but 
you got to realize that realistically, if you look that we have all these open seats right now, and all you're doing right now is you're creating restrictions um, for these people. And, and, and it'd be better if we didn't, have, we had less restrictions and just allowed people to, to serve on um, uh, not only multiple, because this is not clear is, and I'll give you an example is if um, I'm a tag member that has served my two cycles, three cycles on a fire code tag, am I allowed to apply to a different tag or am I um, not able to do that since I was a tag member or is it specific to that individual group or not? Um, but again, I, I don't think we should be limiting uh, this, the terms um, because we're having problems filling the seats now. And I agree if you get somebody in, in a position, hang on to them as long as you can and use them as an alternate when possible. Thanks. I tend to agree with you, Ken. And, and my interpretation would be this, this is a tag by tag qualification. So if somebody did their two terms on a tag and then somebody else said, hey, I'm really interested in doing it, it wouldn't preclude the person from being on a different tag. Uh, one way, one potential uh, uh, language I'd throw out there is that rather than saying maybe reappointed for a third code adoption cycle, is saying maybe reappointed reappointed for additional code adoption cycles and not limited to three. I'd be fine with that. Okay, Jay. As would I. Okay. Can staff make that make that modification to the language on the screen? So tag members may be reappointed for additional code adoption cycles on a case by case basis. It, and then make cycles plural, if you would, please. No, no, no. Take the and out and make cycles plural. Cycles? Yes. I should have given this to Rosanna. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Roger, go ahead. Yeah, I am going to vote no again for this, and it's purely because exactly what Ken said. I see zero benefit in limiting it to two terms, or very, very, very minute benefit. There are very, very few cases where we have somebody on a tag who we don't want on a tag or is not contributing, and we keep applying, uh, you know, keep appointing them cycle after cycle. Um, I think that there's no benefit to limiting it to two. We have a number of different oversights. We've got the the tag chairs that are going to take all of the people that are applying for those positions, figure out who's best. They can weed out those people that have been on there a long time for multiple cycles. Um, whoever, whether it's the executive committee or the full council, is going to vote at the end. I don't see there's like there's any benefit for us putting more restrictions on it. I would. I will support this if we take all of that yellow out that we just did and get rid of the two cycle criteria, but otherwise I'm going to vote no. Okay. Can I clarify something first? Uh, this is in the bylaws and it needs to third vote to change it. Currently in the bylaws, we have uh, one term and maybe reappointed for one additional term. This one, one it is currently in the, in the bylaws. And and if I can respond, I will vote no unless we take out the limit. In my opinion, it should be unlimited code cycles. So I, I would note that we put a provision in there for unlimited code cycles. So that, and that's what's in yellow right now, Roger. When there are no qualified applicants for a specific group, tag members may be reported for additional uh, code adoption cycles on a case-by-case -case basis. I think what we're trying to do here is encourage new blood um, but if, if there aren't any, then you could have somebody on for six code cycles. Roger, do you agree? I just, I just, why have all that language? I don't, I mean, encouraging, um, you know, we're trying to, we're talking, our biggest problem is recruiting people, not yeah. turning people away. I mean, I would like us to spend a whole bunch of time on the meeting today talking about how can we recruit the best group possible and we're spending a bunch of time trying to figure out how we're going to kick people off who are very, very, that are participating. So. Okay, point taken. 
Uh, Chell, go ahead. Yeah, I see this as being an unlimited number of code cycles that just you have to reapply. Um, and so I, I, I don't see any problem with this. I, I see a, a motivated person to be able to stay on there as long as they need to. Um, so I, I think we've solved that issue with this and it, it's better than it it was um, or is now. I think that's good. I'm actually wondering if, Tom, if your motion should could be just to approve these bylaws changes because we've made lots of modifications and I don't know that you want to state all of them in your motion. Um, I think it might be easier just to rescind the motion and then suggest we pass the bylaws as we have modified them. I think that might be cleaner. Yeah, have we, have we uh, I think, have we had discussion and consent? I mean, I, <laughs> I don't even know how to, if if what we're talking about is just what's highlighted in yellow on this page and accepting that as written currently, I mean, I think that that kind of does it. Is there others, but we've talked about other things too, and I don't know if that was in these. I changes. think we're, we're simply talking about number three. I mean, there is some additional language in there we haven't necessarily addressed. Okay. We passed... We passed the uh, the first sentence in number three at a, at a prior meeting. So just reading here really quick. Okay, I, I then will rescind my motion and remake it to adopt section three as written. Okay. Jay, are you are you fine with that? It's in essence the same motion. Yep, and I'll second that. Okay. And are you also including uh, keeping the application process open? Yes. Okay. Yeah, seats vacant until filled. Okay, so the motion is to accept the language on the screen for item three and keeping the, the application process open until filled. Todd. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so I agree with Roger. I'm, I'm not opposed to what's written in yellow, but I think we could also just strike it. I, I, I think the tags... I'm not concerned about it because now we're putting additional mechanisms in for the um, to identify or to to review the applications. But the other thing about tags is these are pretty wonky positions, and when when you do get people, and the um, we want we do want to keep them. We we want historians also. Don't forget that often it, we spend a lot of time unpacking what was the intent three code cycles ago when they put this into place, just like legislators do all the time, you know, trying to unpack that. We need the people in the room that were there. And then the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the other part is, is this is a, this is a good forum for previous um, council members because we limit council members, you know, or the, at least the practice right now is two, three year terms. It's gone before we even under, you know, before we've really gotten up to speed. And this is a good way to continue a lot of that, that, that built up knowledge. So a couple points there, I'll support it either way, but I'd like to strike it. And, and it's also important to point out that uh, we're only talking about the voting members of the tags, that anybody can participate in the tag and comment and, and whatnot. So there's that, that opportunity exists too. Angela? Um, yeah, so I guess I need a little bit of clarification because if we strike the yellow language, the new language, then does the language go back to the current that says you're limited to two terms anyway, with no provisions for additional? Because it currently it says shall serve a three-year term and may be reappointed for one additional term. So if we don't do the yellow language, it's reverting back to the original language, which has no provisions for serving over two terms. So I just, I guess if that's correct, I just wanted to point that out. That, that, that would be technically correct. That's even, the way I read it. Even, yes, it, even, even though in practice, uh, people have been on tags for more than right. two terms or more than two, three year terms. So, and again, I think, I think the, 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 the reason here is to get, is to get new blood, you know, to get, mm -hmm. get, uh, get new people on, but also keep our historical context as well. So, Shell? Yeah, I, 
I still don't think the executive committee is the right committee. What's going to happen is we're going to get applications over the next six months, eight months, a year trickling in. And I don't know how often the executive committee meets, but you know, if you know the some tag is starting to meet, they get an application. Do we need to wait a month until the executive committee meets before that person can join the tag? You know, I, I think that's just too much um handcuffing the process. I think committee chairs in con it should be committee chairs or executive committee can do appointments because I I agree with this first round. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of stuff. Maybe discussion is good, but eventually you're just going to get one trickling in on a Tuesday, and you're going to get one trickling in on a on a you know the following Tuesday. And I don't know that convening the executive committee every time you get a, a tag application in is is what we really want to do. Okay, uh, Roger. Yeah. So um, you know my responding to uh, Angela, I I would say that the second paragraph of number three would only be the first sentence and the last sentence. Tag membership terms shall align with the triennial code adoption cycles. At the beginning of each cycle, the council shall solicit applications for all tag seats. That's what I would say, and we don't care about the number of, of um, but you know, I go back and forth. I said I wouldn't support it. I, as I read it, does it say, um, they, does it allow for it? Maybe um, a couple of other things. Um, I think that the, in my opinion, I, so number two, the the motion on the table is to accept the changes to the um, bylaws, and I think that we need to address. Um, items one and four in Stoyan's email. <laughs> there were some other things. We may be, this may be the best process for us to address those as well, is to make modifications to the bylaws and let's address everything that Stoyan has and then the motion can be approved the bylaw changes as, as specified. And with respect to that and kind of answering Chell's, in my opinion, I think that the, um, the council has, appointed the positions for each tag we've appointed the chairman i believe that we give the chairman of the tag the responsibility to go through the, mm -hmm. the resumes that they have and make a recommendation and i would suggest that the executive committee one that does the final approval put that on the chairs and the executive committee and we don't need to be voting every month on uh 10 you know five people or 10 people put that on, on um, a different group so that, that's my thoughts. I'm not sure how we want to proceed. So, okay. I would rather piecemeal this uh, rather than, I mean, because we could all write a different version of the bylaws and then we have 15 versions to vote on. Uh, right now, the motion on the table is just item number three. So, if we could speak to that and then we'll, we'll vote on it and dismiss with it. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Just in support of item three as um, written, um, I think, Chell, si since we're dealing with the bylaws here, I, I think Chell's got bringing up a point for the vacant open until filled position versus uh, the initial appointments. And since we're talking about the bylaws, if we give the authority to the individual chairs to appoint tag members, it's in the bylaws, they can do it immediately. And I think what I'm hearing, and I, I have talked in support of that there's value in having that initial set of appointments by the executive committee. If we wanted to adopt a separate process to say when there are vacancies in the tag, the tag chair after that initial appointment could um, uh, appoint on their own, I'd support some separate language, but I didn't wanna, wouldn't support a change in what's in section three right now. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Jay, I, I don't know how you do it. You read my mind. I, I was gonna say that too, you know, <laughs> suggesting that there'd be some language that this is, you know, primarily for the initial appointment. And then if as vacancies occur, then the chair has latitude to make those recommendations or make those appointments. 
Great minds, Tom. <laughs> uh, Roger, go ahead. I agree as well. Um, the only comment, Jay, is the, the public perception of does that give the chair too much power to recruit and fill spots? That's kind of why I like the final oversight by the executive committee. But yes, I, I agree. It needs to be primary point needs to be the chair of the tag. So perhaps we can uh, get this one voted in and then if we want to make a modification to to that effect, we can do that. Roger, do you have anything else? Okay, then seeing no, seeing no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, we can also fix it if we decide later that it's really broken. True. Yeah. Okay. Uh, since this is a bylaw change and needs a two thirds vote, uh, I'm going to call for a roll call. Cal Anderson. Aye. Jay Arnold. Aye. Todd Byrither. Aye. Justin Borgo. Aye. Damon, uh, Tom Handy. Aye. Uh, Angela Hopp. Aye. Roger Haringa. I'll vote yes. Matthew Hepner. Greg Holt. Ty Menzer. Yes. Ben Amora. Yes. Pete Ricky. Katie Sheehan. Yes. Thanks, guys. Okay. Um, Stoyan, you brought up four points. I think we've covered two. Uh, could you recap other things we may need to tackle here? Uh, actually, you covered three. I removed it. Uh, it was for do. Do we need to uh, specify how many teams or advisory groups one person can serve? On? And I removed it, so we took care of this. Uh, I will clean up the language. Uh, I I don't want to write right now on the screen, but I think I think oh, last thing, but. It's not in the bylaws. I think you clarified that. So the positions are open until filled, which means mm -hmm. we have a building official or fire marshal or whatever applying for a position that is not specifically related to their occupation, then we'll keep the position open and it will be open until filled. This is how I understood the conversation. Okay. Uh, so my question for you is, since we are on the initial appointment and we need to do it ASAP, uh, are the council members okay if staff taking into consideration what was discussed today and what was voted for the bylaws? If we put together the appointments and then uh, 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 schedule a meeting for the executive committee to approve these appointments or make changes there? Is it? Yeah. Okay. And, and, and can we be sure to send out the resumes? I mean, pe people may choose to read through them all or not, but uh, let's have that information available to the executive committee. Okay. And then uh, I personally am going to go out and solicit to fill some of these vacant spots. Um, ventilation and indoor air quality are real important items to me, anyways. Um, and so I'd like to see some. I, I know experts in that field, so I, I will personally go out and try to do that, and I would encourage other council members to do the same. Yeah, I've, I've got somebody for the indoor air quality that I might be able to pull in, too, so let me see what I can come up with. Wonderful. Cool. Uh, where are we at here? So we are on, we did our, I think, did we just cover item nine? Uh, yes, we okay. did. Uh, it's sure. Go ahead. It's 120. The meeting is scheduled scheduled until until two o'clock. We have agenda item 10, which is tax seats for 2021 and 2024 residential energy code and residential and we codes. We can do it now, we can do it later. Uh, we haven't started with uh, uh this codes yet. So it's up to the council how how you okay. want. Let, let me ask this. We we've, we've just approved number three in your your uh, bylaw change here. 
do we want to address the other items that are on here one through five or if if you want i don't think there is something difficult but if you want i would appreciate that if you don't we'll keep it open until uh, we are ready with the more, more important parts okay uh, number two looks very simple it's a it looks like a definition change Yeah, this is a language from uh, 6291. Uh, and uh, item four, I will make the change consistent with the first paragraph of item three. And then uh, it it is a clarifying, it is a clarifying language uh, in item four. Do we it, need a do we need a vote on that? Yes. Yes, if we are making changes to the bylaws, yes, we need to vote. We need to vote on it. If, if the council wants to vote now, and uh, uh, this is fifteen voting members, it was agreed upon. Uh, so uh, I don't. Again, personally, I don't think there is something uh, difficult to just clarify. If if we have uh, an empty position, uh, and the staff shall continue the recruitment until the position is. Uh, 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 field. It's okay. it's what we just discussed. It just uh, located in a different uh, a subsection. Okay, uh, Katie. Yeah. Um. I. I. I'm just trying to clarify where you know we talked about potentially for number two. Um. Up a little bit, perhaps adding. Um. That somebody who was had the letter of recommendation from their um association or whatever is that where this would go or no there is a section that was discussed if you remember this uh, 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 a work group there was a, a different section of, related to uh, uh, applications and uh, it, it was exactly what we did this time but I didn't propose this today because I don't want to waste too much time on it. We'll, we'll do it in pieces when the time comes, if we have time, because it wasn't that much important for today's meeting. So I didn't think we we'll... So there's so there's there's not really any guidance other than what's in here, number two, for our tag chairs to say who is better qualified for those seats that where there are more than one applicant. Is that correct? Or um, is there... there is nothing that, that clarifies that. Okay. I mean, I trust our tag chairs and I, and so that's, um, but I, in order for them, you know, to, in case that's helpful, I, I would, um, I, I like this number two, um, but I, I, if there's any guidance that they need, um, seems like we need to do it now. This is again the language in the bill. Of course, the bylaws can be uh, uh, the language in the bylaws can clarify or make it more specific. So we can add to this. I wasn't just prepared to add anything. So he, my ears are open and everything that is offered, I can, I can, uh, if there is an agreement, I can add it to it. No, I it's it's fine. I just I I want to be make sure that we're giving everybody what they need for to for this um next step. What they give here is what I believed was important for the appointment of the technical advisor. This is why you you, you see the language here. The language in item two I added it because it I I thought it was a copy paste from the law, so I Okay, Roger. Yeah, Katie, I would just respond. I, I agree with the concept that that's important, but understanding that this is the bylaws and legislating in the bylaws, how we make opinion, you know, formulating opinions may not be the right way to go. Um, going back to, and then slowly, and I actually thought that we had approved these bylaws changes last month or the month before I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go back through the comments or the, the meeting minutes to confirm, but um, I would certainly prefer, I mean, we've been looking at these for several cycles. Um, 
we just need to pick something and move forward, in my opinion. Um, and my comment about making all of the changes, to be honest, just a few tweaks to the middle sentence in, in, in the first paragraph of number three would also probably accommodate what we had talked about. And that would be after the designated by the council on the fourth line down. It's and appointed by the uh, appointed by the tag chair and approved by the council or executive committee. I mean, the tags appointing them, but then you get approval by the council or the or the executive committee. You might want to highlight that because that's a change, but that basically would change to be basic what we just talked about is the tag chair is the one that that recommends and appoints those people, but that does get approval by either the council in the first case or the executive committee if it's after the fact. And I'm happy to make that a motion, Damon. I don't know if we, again it would, it would need to be. I, and I'm, I'm making a motion is just, are we going to, we've, again, we've looked at these uh, bylaws changes for three or four months now. Do we want to do one more and, and do the final approval next month? Or do we just want to try to get it right and approve it all today and say we're done with it? Well, okay, here's, here's my thoughts. Um, we've got, uh, we've got 33 minutes remaining. Um, as far as the last three items on the agenda, the tag seats for the two tags listed, uh, those are group two, so they're not. There's not a. There's not an urgency there to get those um, uh, those seats sorted out. Um, I would. My preference would be to get get this Article Three uh, handled, and yes. dispensed with, so we don't have to bring it up yet again for a, a fifth meeting. And if I still have the the floor, I would suggest priority wise this this is related to getting our tags filled that we need to be functioning in the next month or six weeks. Mm -hmm. So I would say let's get this where we're all comfortable with it and vote on it and be done with it. Okay. Um, so Roger has moved that that all tag members are appointed by the tag chair. Um, because up above somewhere we say that the what's that? Did we get a second? Do we yes. Have okay. I'll second it, Justin. Okay. I, I, you know, uh, other than speak, I'll speak to it. I think that that's what we've all been talking about. Um, you know, the tag, the council is still appointing the tag chairs, so we have that oversight. So I think that there's plenty of oversight in this case, and allows the tag chair and the executive committee to help us fill the tag positions, which really is our biggest challenge. Okay, yeah, I, I, I tend to lean toward having the executive committee do it, but that's my opinion. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, to me, it seems like if you're saying appointed by the tag chair, then it's a done deal. Yeah. Um, I think the wording may be wrong there for the intent, but I'm, you know, my my comment initially was that I thought we already voted on number nine um, at some point. And so I'm just kind of, I, I don't know, maybe it was a different group. Maybe the meetings are all mushing together on me. Um, and number two, it seems like a, that's something we have to add. So can I... Can I modify my motion to say recommended by the tag chair and approved by? Is that the word that you're thinking of, Tom? I think that would be more appropriate there, yeah. Okay. Is, does the second... Uh, I'll here? accept. Okay. Grammatically, I think you'd put a comma after council, then recommended by the tag chair and approved by the council. To be a come after council just before where you are. Well, the council is designated by the council. The De group designated by the council, comma, recommended by the tag chair, and approved by the council or executive committee. I think that would be the grammatically correct way to say it. I'll, well, consider, that that a, I'll consider that a friendly amendment since I'm an engineer, not an English major. <laughs> 
Todd, go ahead. <laughs> Let's support all this, so thank you. Um, I am confirming that we don't have any requirements in here that they have to have a letter of recommendation or nomination from a trade association. I don't I don't think that's necessary at this level. We need flexibility to find the subject matter experts and 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 these are the advisory advisors. The we already have it and it's reinforced in 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 the bill that was just passed 6291 that now now in fact it says the largest trade association. So the committee the council members are already reinforcing what the trade associations you know are um you know we 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 can take care of that. So, thanks for that flexibility. Okay, uh, I see no hands, so we have a motion to ac accept the new language in section three, which is recommended by the tag chair and approved by the council or executive committee. Uh, Damon, I actually and and. If if this is overstepping the bounds, my assumption on the on the motion was to accept all of the changes on the page, including to two, three, four, five, and I don't remember if we get down to six or seven. Well, that would certainly be tidy. However, that was not your motion, uh, but we could do that. We could we could look at that. Uh... Uh, point of order, Mr. Chair, I would um, suggest we move forward with the motion as made because uh, I would end up calling division. Uh, okay. I have a comment on number nine. Okay. If we did a big motion, thank you. So you mean you, you want to bifurcate the motion then? So, okay. Uh, Roger, is that fine with you? Yes. Okay. So, uh, seeing no other hands. Oh, wait, we did have some uh, public comment here. Uh, bear with me. I thought I saw some public comment. Oh, oh, hey, Micah. <laughs> I apologize, folks. I'm back. And can you clarify the motion for me? This is for approval or to move into rulemaking? No, this doesn't need to rulemaking. Micah, this is the bylaw. Okay, not the bylaw. Okay, the bylaw posted in WAC 5104. What we have here is the language from the bylaws, not not the WAC. 5104 is the policies and procedures, not the bylaws. So great. Was this document posted on the website? No, it wasn't because uh, I wasn't sure if the council members would like to go this way, but. It's been discussed several times. It just uh, summarizes everything that was discussed, and it's related to uh, the appointment of the technical advisor group. Okay, so the public has not had a chance or opportunity to actually review this for this meeting and provide adequate public comment. Is that what I'm hearing? I would argue, Micah. Oh, wait, hold, Roger. Excuse me. I just I want to hold on. It was a little bit of a leading question by Micah, so uh, I want to be clear. Yes, about it was. That. Thanks, dear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're testing me as to whether I'm paying attention, Micah. The answer is yes. Um, I, I just want to say that uh, this item was uh, identified in the uh, agenda, and uh, public comment is allowed on the item, and that is what you you are providing right now. No, I agree the public comment is provided. However, this document was not posted to the documents on the council mem on the council meeting page. So this it would be and, and I I'm not disagreeing that this has not been shared before shared, but again it was not posted to the meeting for review prior for potential public to develop comments to this language except right here on the spot. I, uh, I will ask for an opinion from Derek, but this language has mm -hmm. been shown in multiple SBCC committee meetings over the last few months. In has my, it been posted to those meetings? In, yes. I would have to check. In my opinion, we are making some minor final modifications and adopting it, but I would... Uh, ask Dirk to say if we have somehow overstepped our bounds on yeah so yeah Roger thanks thanks for asking um you know I'm not aware of any um whack 
governing the council or general rule that would uh, require the council to make publicly available to members of the public, I guess that's redundant, to make available to members of the public uh, proposed bylaw changes um, that, you know, that might be best practice, that might be good business. Um, there might be a bunch of reasons not to do that. Legally, though, I don't understand that to be something that is required. Of course, it is required under the OPMA to allow members of the public uh, to submit public comments on um, you know, either prior to or at the hearing on uh, on items in which uh, action is taken. And so long as you're doing that, I think you're compliant. But as far as you know, any specific uh, obligation that you would have to to get public comment on bylaw changes, I, I'm not aware of that. And if I could comment, uh, the bylaws are on the SBCC website. Uh, item nine does say potential changes of council bylaws pertaining to appointment of tag members, and that we have also wordsmithed the heck out of this at this council meeting. So regardless of what was written prior, we're fixing it now. Uh, we've got three more people. I'm going to go ahead and uh, let them. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate that. Go ahead, Derek. Yeah, and uh, Micah, I'm sorry, and, and Damon, I know you uh, want to get on. I do want to say, respond to one thing from Micah. Micah did make a, uh, ask a question about the wax, uh, and, and I don't see anything in the wax that uh, are aligned to this specific issue. But if there is, if the wax do need to be changed, then that would obviously need to be done through a, a, a public comment uh, period. But, but that's not what's on the table today. I, I appreciate it. I guess my only complaint is we're hearing from the folks we represent about the transparency and lack thereof that the SBCC continues to have. And this is just another example of it where, well, that's okay. Enough people have had enough time on this and we're just gonna ignore allowing the public to actually review the documents in advance to provide adequate, maybe language changes or input other than the quick public comment that's allowed at the meeting. Um, I'm not recommending that you do anything other than this. I'm just voicing the concern. And again, that is something the SBCC has heard over the past few years. Chairman, if I, Chairman, if I may respond, go ahead. The uh, the SPC has also been uh, uh, looked at in a uh, bad way, and that we aren't getting our work done, and we need to get our work done and get our tags started so that we can meet our deadlines in order to approve the next code cycle. Um, my suggestion, if there is any concern with uh, our appearance to the public, is uh, today we go through and we as a council approve all of these bylaw changes pending any public comments and we post these changes and we do final public comment approval at the next meeting. And final approval pending if there are any public comments. So we allow the public, we're done today and we allow the public one more chance to look at it. I don't even know if that's in order, uh, Derek. Somebody have a, Derek, you have an opinion on this? I mean, we've, we've already passed a motion. Uh, looking at number nine, that was passed at a previous meeting. So I'm I'm confused here. Well, yeah, I am. From a parliamentary perspective, I don't think Rod, Rogers, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a good, you know, from a policy perspective, I think it makes sense, but it, it might not be the right time to offer it up. It, it, after you take action on all of these, if, if someone wants to offer a motion, hey, let's revisit this next week or next, I'm sorry, next uh, meeting and review it again and maybe take another vote if we have received substantive comments. I mean, you could vote on the bylaws at any time, right? So long as you get two thirds of the vote. So that might be a way to do it. But uh, at this time, I, I don't think that that is the right time for the motion. Okay. Um, I've had three members of the public move on to, to comment here. So I'm going to let them in and then we'll come back to the council. Uh, Ken, go ahead. So I just kind of have a clarifying question. Um, one, and I'll uh, first question is, are you reopening the advertisement for the current group one? Two, it appears that some people that have been on the meeting were thinking that the group one uh, tag members were going to be approved today, and that does not appear that that's going to happen today. So we're kicking the can down the road again, um, even though you just approved a, a new calendar. Um, and then three, uh, what happens if there's disagreement between the tag chair, the executive committee, or the council on the appointments? So those are my, I guess, one statement and two questions. Thanks. <laughs> okay. And, and Ken, I would I would uh, presume that what you just said would be the order in which the 
PEG members were appointed. It would be the, the chair's recommendation, the executive committee's vote, and if there was still dissension, it would go to the full council. So what you're saying is there, what I understand is right right now, the group one, um, everybody's applied, all of the names that were just listed and posted, um, those still are going to go through a, an additional selection process prior to us, the tag starting, correct? So the, there's, you're not, nobody's ready to make any recommendations for the tag right now. I presume where we have multiple applicants for a single position, that that's something that needs to be discussed either by executive committee or by the council. And you do not have any executive meeting dates posted yet? We do no. Not. We can uh, schedule a special uh, meeting. And uh, we touched on this like 20 minutes ago. Uh, following the uh, council directions, staff will clean up the proposals and we'll introduce this uh, to the technical advisory group chairs and then it will go to the executive committee. Does that answer your question, Ken? Yeah, I, I believe so. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Larry. Yeah, I, I really support Roger on this as being a member of the public and, and, I mean, we've made so many different changes here and they, and they might all be great changes, but it'd be nice to have some time, maybe an hour or two where you can sit down and look at what we finally ended up with as a general public person. And, um, and, you know, you guys could vote on it then, and then say, like Roger said, I, I really like what Roger came up with, to be honest, as a public person out here. I mean, it gives us time to see what you guys approved. And and it still gives us one little shot for for us to see what you've actually approved. OK, I mean, it's hard to I mean, I've been back and forth and I and I attend a lot of these meetings, but I want to I want to see all this in writing and then look at it and see how it's all going to drop out at, at the end. And, and I think Roger's idea does that for the public. Uh, thank you. Thanks. And, and you know, I, again, I'll remind everybody that some of these things have already been passed in previous motions. Um, once we get it done, it can always be brought up. We, we, could, we could choose to amend the bylaws at every meeting. I would hope that's not the case, but the, the vehicle is there to do that. Uh, Dave, go ahead. Dave Cocott. Thank you. Just want to bring a couple items up because having been on the council, and I, I hear in, in Micah's tone, it's different when you're no longer on the council because the council has a lot of discussions. And example of today, I had my hand up, I don't know how many times, trying to provide some public testimony. I just gave up. Uh, so my perception is the council really doesn't want to listen to what I have to say. I think they've already made their decisions. So Yes, the council needs to, that's a perception problem. They do need to listen to the public a little bit better. And I hope to improve that. The other thing is the council needs to focus on public response to things. I'm hearing a lot of things to the council. It's almost like personal, personal opinion rather than what does this group think of this? What does this group think of this? Because we're doing things to them and Basically, like some of these bylaw changes and things that we're talking about here, I 100% concur that if it wasn't published, it, it is a courtesy of the Building Code Council to allow the public time to look at the language before it's voted on, because it does affect things that we're also looking at as well. I, For instance, the, I, I was definitely going to speak about the issue of, the, I think, in the bylaws, it does need to say that certain positions that are under a particular group such as the fire or building officials should be approved by those particular people. I appreciate what Todd said is the language is coming up uh, from the bill will help have a clarification for that, but it's also not in the bylaws. Somebody's going to go to the bylaws not to go look to someplace else. Perception is, oh, they're just making their own mind up to whatever they want to do. So um, 
yeah you guys are doing what you're doing but uh i tell you what it's it is interesting once you've been on the council coming back off and seeing how things are going you'd sure have a different perspective about what you've been doing today that's all i have my comments and i look forward to working with you and and dave if i uh if i missed calling on you earlier or didn't see your hand up i apologize for that um my my intent is certainly to have everybody involved uh micah I appreciate the opportunity again. I just wanted to respond to something Roger said um, that may be a misconception. You don't need to pass these changes in order for the TAG to start their work. We have current bylaws that the TAGs can function under and be appointed under. I believe I've mentioned this in the previous meetings where you could move forward with the current language of the bylaws or even the WAC rules for, for development of code um, proposals. And work on this during this code cycle to modify it for next code cycle. So to say we have to pass this in a big hurry uh, to get the tags functioning, I, I believe is a false uh, bit of information. We have current bylaws that function. Maybe they are broken in some way, but that doesn't mean we should rush through changes in order to get a tag up and running when we can do that under the current bylaws. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Greg Johnson. Can you guys hear me? Yep, go ahead. Uh, I'm not clear as a tag, excuse me, as a tag applicant, I'm not quite clear on what criteria is being used to select uh, tag members uh, for unopposed positions. Uh, I guess that doesn't really matter, but on uh, where you have multiple candidates for one position, there really is, seems to be a lack of clarity on uh, how you'll select one member versus another. And will that be done in open setting or is that all gonna be done in executive session behind closed doors? Um, and how does that relate to OPMA for um, selection? Uh, having been, this will be my first time going through the process so I can't speak to anything historically. Uh, just because it's being done by the executive committee does not indicate executive session. So I would assume that it would be in an open meeting and uh, available and open to the public. Yeah, if Derek or Stoyan have additional information, I would welcome it. If it's the executive committee, it should be open meeting. And how it was done historically, um, I, I, I have my history here on the left, but uh, to the best of my understanding, the tag chairs were appointing? Um, the tag chairs were appointing or committee chairs um, as we needed for infill, the initial appointments were recommendations from the staff and uh, appointment by the council. Okay. So, so if, if Michael wants to do the same thing, I, I'm okay. I would like to make the recommendations. I'm just trying to uh, be fair to the council members and allow them to uh, take action on this. But uh, if we keep the same bylaws, and again, I'm not against the bylaws, but if we keep the same bylaws, we have to eliminate probably half of the applicants that submitted applications based on the current bylaws. Okay. Uh, Jay, go ahead. So on to the issue of uh, transparency as we're talking about here. The changes that we're proposing to the bylaws actually make this process more transparent and more flexible. Number one, today under our bylaws, uh, tag chairs can appoint tag members. That was would be the process that we would have if we don't make changes. What we're doing today is making it something that happens by the executive committee and therefore will happen in an open public meeting. Uh, so I, I think we are improving the transparency in that standpoint. The other changes we've talked about are small and increased flexibility. It's recognizing the fact that instead of a rigid three-year term, we're talking about code cycles. Uh, we're, we're providing for the opportunity for somebody to serve in more than two code cycles or more than two terms, which wouldn't exist today. So it, if we were making some bylaws changes that were real big policy changes or real restrictive, I'd get 
um, the feedback that Micah or Dave are mentioning, but we're being more transparent and more flexible and having a good discussion on the fly um, with some of these amendments. So I uh, disagree with the need that they are suggesting and that Rogers put out there that this needs to go through one uh, more SBCC meeting. We need to get moving on this tag process. And the level of change here, I'm comfortable with us making the decision today. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Todd? Uh, thank you. Um, so in support, that was my the reason to bring this forward today. I, I wanted to propose that we bring it more into a, into, um, into a forum that, that's more appropriate and not maybe the whole council meeting where we you know, we've had to put it under a kind of a panelist um, structure with the Zoom because of of when we when we were hacked. Um, as you know, when we run the smaller committee meetings, the standing committees or the tags, those are very open forums. And and my intent was, one, we would have that debate. It would be a dedicated session for for this discussion. Um, and most importantly, to Dave Cocott and Ken, your, your your points that you're part of that conversation, that the TAG members are, are part of that, making sure that we have the consistency with the intent of the subject matter experts that are they're qualified so forth, but more, you know, more importantly, that we're meeting that consistency with the representation of all the council members. So that if a fire official, we can have that discussion, whether or not that person is also representing that stakeholder um, group. So. That's my intent. I would hope we would have that very quickly. I don't think we should wait. I think we should schedule it and get going and 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 move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I agree with with what has been said, with especially with Jay. I don't see how, he, see how anybody can reasonably say this is rushed. Um, we've these have been on the agenda for over six months, um, months and months and months. Um, this is about how we move forward as a council. I think we have actual things to do, and these are minor adjustments, and I think they're good, and then they're necessary. Um, every meeting is public, and I think, you know, to Jay's point, this brings the tag appointments even more public than they were before and provides more flexibility. So I, I guess I see no problem with moving forward with the bylaws changes today and the motion on the table, and if you know, there's a grave error we make today. I, I think we could resolve it in our next meeting. I think we need to move forward with getting the tags together and getting our actual work done. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Roger, would you restate your motion, please? I don't I don't know that we have <laughs> moved to accept all changes on the screen. Correct. Can you, my, my motion was just to make the modification to uh, the first paragraph of number three, if you can page up. So, comma, recommend the, the tags are recommended by the tag chair and approved by the council or executive committee. Okay. Uh, again, uh, Micah, go ahead. We want to give Micah the ability to unmute his microphone. Micah, are you able to unmute? Oh, there you go. There I am now. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the information from the council members on this. Yes, this has been a topic that has been discussed. However, this document that is being shown has been posted one time, and that was from a February meeting. So again, I'm not disputing that this will be transparent, as Jay said. I'm not disputing that this has been official for the TAG advancement and that this may be good. However, my concern was about public input and public access. This may be more transparent in the future, but right now you're making rule changes on the fly or bylaw changes on the fly with very little public input. And I think you should just pause, let this public access or public folks have some input on this, whether you think it's minor or not, and say, hey, we listen, we're gonna allow you this time for input and come back to it. Again, you can function the tags with the current bylaws. And I'm not sure, you know, Sony made a comment about, oh, we would have to eliminate half the members. I'm not even sure where he's pulling that from in the bylaws, and maybe that can be explained further so the public understands why this is really necessary. 
you have bylaws that allow tags now. Again, let the public have input. Thanks. I can I can clarify. Currently in the bylaws, one term, and then maybe reappointed for another term. And we have many applicants that they've been served for more than two terms. So we, we need to eliminate these folks, uh, unfortunately, uh, without questioning their knowledge and technical expertise. It just, this is if we want to stick with the bylaws. And I want to stick with the bylaws because I don't want to pay more money from the SBCC budget for more lawsuits in the future. In the future. Okay. We have a motion on the table and we're down to a little more than three minutes. Um, I don't see any further comment. So let's take a quick roll call vote on the motion where it's comma recommended by the tag chair and approved by the council or executive committee. We can do a roll call, please. Chell Anderson. Yes. Jay Arnold. Yes. Todd Byrou there. Aye. Justin Borgo. Aye. Tom Handy. Yes. Angela Hopp. Yes. Roger Haringa. Yes. Matthew Hefner. Craig Cole. Kai Menzer. Yes. Ben Omura. Yes. Pete Rickey. Katie Sheehan. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Um, is there a motion to extend the meeting? I would move that we extend the meeting till, I don't know, 3.20 or 3.30, and we try to get through the uh, rest of those bylaw items, what is it, 8 and 9 or 5 and 9 or whatever those numbers are. Did you mean 2.30 or 3.30? Oh, sorry. Yes, 2.30. <laughs> I'll second that. Okay, there's a motion to extend for half an hour. <laughs> Thank you. If, if I could say, I just, I observed a lot of panicked faces, Roger, when you uh, proposed <laughs> It's the time change. That's what the problem is. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, the motion to extend for half an hour. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. If we can continue the discussion here, you want to scroll to the top. So, anybody uh, have a motion in regards to item number two? I, I believe and please correct me if I'm wrong, that we have voted on item three in its entirety. Jay? Twice. Yeah. Twice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize. I have a hard stop and we'll have to um, uh, leave it too. I did want to point out for uh, section, um, I think if you could scroll down, uh, I think it was section five, Sorry, section nine below. Um, just a, as the council is considering these change, um, the maximum of 15 voting members, we've set up for all the tags except for the energy code tag. And given the energy code tag is actually developing policy out of whole cloth versus uh, starting with the ICC as a stand, uh, starting point, we um, added additional stakeholders when we kind of slated those out. And I just wanted to make sure that that gets handled separately. Um, I apologize, but I'm not gonna be able to uh, continue in the discussion. Uh, unless you guys go beyond 2.30, I will rejoin. Thank you and have a good weekend. Yeah, and and, and Jay, just real quick, uh, that was something that I was I intended to bring up. I had talked to council on this. Um, we may have been in violation of a previous motion when we, when we expanded the energy code tag. Um, I would also argue that it's not a full cloth uh, code, is that we do have a, a robust document from the ICC and the IECC codes. So uh, that was something I, I was going to ask the council to readdress. Um, but, but just giving you a, a heads up on that. Shell? I'll make a motion that we approve Sorry. item two as amended. Okay. Can we scroll back up to item two, please? Uh, point of order. Yep. The last vote, we had 10 votes, which is the two-thirds we need. If 
Jay leaves, we will not have ten votes. <laughs> and it looks like Jay has left. You, you will if the chair votes. Oh, there we go. Yes. Okay. So Charles made a motion to accept item two as amended. Is there a second? Second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion from the public? Hearing none, can we do a roll call vote, please? Chell Anderson? Aye. Jay Arnold? Todd Byruther? Aye. Justin Borgo? Aye. Tom Handy? Aye. Angela Hoff? Aye. Roger Haringa? Yes. Uh, Matthew Hepner? Craig Holt? Uh, Ty Menser? Aye. Ben O'Mara? Yes. Pete Ricky? Katie Sheehan? Yes. And Damon Doyle? Aye. Yeah, that was 10. Motion carries. Um, the last portion that's unamended is items four and nine. Uh, is there a motion to accept? Well, let's 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 bifurcate this. Uh, is there a motion to accept item number four? So moved. Second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? I want to clarify the language. So what I have here, can we do this? Just strike it. Because typically uh, we are appointing, the council is appointing the technical advisory group chairs. Mm -hmm. Todd, go ahead. Uh, Chair, I just was going to ask for if there was public comment on this one before we vote. I, I did. I, I oh, okay. That. Thank you. I missed. I don't. That. I don't see. I don't see any hands up. So. Okay. Um. Do, do, do. So the, uh, the the chairs have traditionally been appointed by the standing committee chair. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Or, or we, we, okay. by the council. By the council. Okay. Okay. Uh, Chell, go ahead. Yeah, and I think this complies with the legislation that was recently passed where only one council member can be on the tag at a time. So I think this number four is important to address that. Right. That the only one council member can vote at a time on a tag. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Okay. Any, uh, any further discussion on item number four? Hearing none, can we do a roll call vote, please? Chell Anderson? Yes. Ray Arnold? Todd Byruther? Aye. Justin Borgo? Aye. Tom Handy? Aye. Angela Hopp? Aye. Roger Haringa? Aye. Matthew Hepner? Craig Holt? Ty Menser? Aye. Ben O'Mara? Yes. yes. Kate Rickey, Katie Sheehan, yes, and Damon Doyle, aye. Okay, motion carries. Uh, the last bylaw modification is number nine. Uh, I will remind the committee again that we did pass a motion previously to limit it to fifteen. So, uh, Derek, I don't know if you want to jump in and help me here. Uh, the what, what we're what we're making these modifications would this be a uh, yeah Damon why don't you why don't you state the so just in, in full transparency Damon and I had a conversation a few weeks back about some questions he had pertaining to uh, the question uh, on the vote that was taken with respect to increasing from fifteen to eighteen and we had a conversation about it. Uh, and Damon, maybe for purposes of, of the council, it'd be best if you kind of scope out what your thoughts were, and then I can react to that. Yeah, I'd, I'd heard from another individual, uh, you know, we we passed a motion to limit all tags to 15. Uh, when we went through the first three tags, uh, we, we cut tag seats out 
and, and shrunk them down to 15 until we got to the commercial energy code and we stretched it out. So it was in violation of the motion previously. And as somebody else, one of the council members pointed out, uh, you know, we can't make one tag special over the other tags. Um, so. Yeah, uh, so. Oh, I'm sorry. You were saying so, which meant that you were going to say something else, and then I jumped in. Sorry. <laughs> so Derek's going to explain more. <laughs> well, I, I, well, I, I don't know. I want to be careful. So, so I want to be clear. Damon, and I didn't prep prior to this meeting for me to like, you know, share exactly what it is that we talked about. But I, I want to sketch out a little bit of what that conversation is. I, I don't know if I would use words like in violation of or the, it, it. It was different then, right? So, a, a, a council, any governing body, a legislature can adopt policy. <laughs> And as we've gone through before, right, those actions can be changed under Robert's rules. So this is kind of a little bit of a Robert's rules discussion. Uh, and I'm sorry, Jay's not here because I know Jay has uh, opinions on Robert's rules that are often very helpful. Um, Robert's rules, as, as we've had discussions in the past and taken action in the past, does allow, of course, uh, a, a body to change its mind. It has to, right? Bodies sometimes change their minds, but but there are there's a procedural way to do that, right? A parliamentarily uh, sort of according to Hoyle way to do that. And that would be, I think folks are familiar now with the motion to rescind or a motion to amend a prior motion. So those are kind of the more formal ways of, of addressing that. And then it, once you slot into those categories, right, of changing prior action through those types of motions, there's also a motion for reconsideration too, right? What we've talked about before, that can only be done under Robert's rules at the same meeting. But in, in subsequent meetings, we have motions to rescind, motions to amend, motions previously passed. Um, there are certain rules though that follow those. One is uh, there can't be a pending motion at the time that those motions are made. Uh, and then also importantly, there's some notice requirements. So if, if somebody is gonna offer up a motion to uh, rescind, send or amend a previous action, uh, Robert's rule says, provide notice of that, that that's going to happen in the meeting notice. If you do that, you can pass it by a majority vote. If you don't provide that specific notice, you can still do it, but there needs to be two thirds votes. And that's what, uh, that's Robert's rules requirement. Now, I haven't gone back and studied the previous vote uh, on this issue. I'm pretty confident it came up while there was um a prior vote, or I'm sorry, a, a pending motion, and, and it was amendment to the motion. So that might have been um, out of order. Uh, there wasn't an objection though at the time, and, and generally we're not going to go back and say, "Hey, there something was out of order." Therefore, we're going to um, we're going to you know that's void it or it's non-compliant or, or the rest. Um, but I did want to share those thoughts that if we are, and again, there's nothing wrong with it, but if we mm -hmm. are going to set policy in a certain way and then subsequently change that. And we want to follow Robert's rules and Robert's rules has certain expectations about how we go about doing that. Now, how, how you want to deal with that here? Um, I, I'm not going to make a recommendation on that. I don't want to speak for you, Damon, but I think your concern is that maybe that last vote to extend to 18 was not appropriate because there wasn't sufficient notice or that it was out of order at the time. And, and you know, I, I welcome you to have those conversations. Uh, but that's generally what the issue is. The solution, of course, would be to take another vote on that uh, without notice. If it's an amendment, then I make my recommendation would be that it have to be a two thirds vote. And I don't know if now is the right time to do that without everybody on the council here. That's ultimately up to you all. Um, but uh, if you do note this up for a subsequent meeting, then if you want to make a change, uh, a majority vote would be uh, the way to go. Thank you. Um, I don't see, remember again, we're just talking about voting members of TAGs. We're not limiting TAG participation. We can have, you know, 40 people show up to comment on a TAG. Numerous people can submit TAG recommendations. It's just the voting. It seems to me that either we need to revisit the vote on the commercial energy code TAG and go back down to 15 seats or open the voting back up on the previous three TAGs and allow them to potentially grow. So I open it up to the council for a discussion on that. Shell, go ahead. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to follow this, and let me know if I understand or or don't. So we at one point voted to limit all tags to 15 men members, 
And that was not changing the bylaws, right? That was um, a rule that we, a self-imposed rule that we agreed on in a meeting at some point. And, and I guess what binding effect does that have on future discussion since it was not a bylaws change or encoded in any sort of law or rulemaking? Yeah. Do you mind if I jump in, Chell? So I want to be clear. There is no binding effect on like a legislature. You cannot bind future council members from taking action. Right. Um, what I'm speaking to is Robert's rules and its requirements regarding making changes to motions that are previously adopted. And um, again, on Robert's rules contemplates two ways of doing that, either rescinding, taking a vote on rescinding the previous uh, adopted motion or um, amending it. Now, to be sure, there probably, you could probably think of Chell countless instances in the last couple of years where, hey, you know, the council has tweaked something going forward and there wasn't, uh, you know, notice of it and, and all that. I, I'm not suggesting that the council has openly flouted Robert's rules, but, you know, we try to be efficient, move things forward. And sometimes Robert's rules, it, it, conversation about specifically what's required isn't centered in the votes that we're taking um, or that you're taking, not me. Uh, but again, this was an issue that came up uh, and uh, uh, welcome Damon to offer up his proposed uh, approaches to that. But uh, it, it, I hope that was clear because now suddenly it's a word salad that I've offered to you. But no, nobody's talking about you can't change it or you're stuck. We were just talking about what's the right way to go about uh, making changes to previously adopted policies. Okay, because the, the intent was clear. We we discussed it thoroughly when we went from 15 to 18 for the energy code tag. We were well aware that in fact we were going above 15. And I and that's I think clear from the record. Uh, uh, I guess I, that's, I, that's I was, agree that there there was some discussion at the time. People were aware of what the decision was. Again, the only question here is whether from a parliamentary perspective, under Robert's rules, that was the right way to go about doing it. Okay, so I guess I'm interested in what a remedy would be to that, because I think, you know, my opinion and I, the opinion of the council was that 18 was a better number than 15 for the energy code tags, and that's what we voted on. So I guess to make that a reality, there needs to be some Robert's rules, something or other to to have the will of the council be aligned fully with Robert's rules. That, that's what it sounds like to me. So I guess I'm interested in what that remedy looks like because we've already put it out for tag applications and um, we will want to appoint people to those positions soon. So if we made a Robert's rules mistake, how do we, how do we fix it in, under Robert's rules? And that's why I brought this up for discussion. Um, and again, and, and to be clear, we made it for the commercial energy go tag. We haven't discussed the residential energy go tag as of yet, so it's just a commercial. Uh, Ty, I see your hand up, but Mikey did have his hand up before. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call Mikey really quick. If I could. Thanks, Damon. And I was probably one of the vocal proponents on this change during that meeting. I believe that Derek did address this and Chill entered the information in his motion to approve the 18 member energy code tag. And um, I'm not certain at that time, I, I probably would have objected if I realized that there was something, an issue outstanding there. And maybe that's why Damon's bringing it up because he believed there was as well. Um, I, I don't know if this makes any difference at this point, but um, it seems like the action would be to um, either approve 18 voting members or as I mentioned before, maybe we need to increase that number across the board, although it's been a struggle to fill those positions as far as I'm aware so far. Um, because we did have, I think, 18 or 20 seats recommended for the building code and the residential code, but we chose not to move forward with allowing that many number of members other than the energy code. And, and I was probably one of the more vocal opponents to this. So I, I think there's action that could be taken. I don't know what direction that would go. Um, Good luck. 
<laughs> but I was the vocal opponent. I was I was the one that probably opposed it the most, not the most, but um, brought it up when we took action because we did take action on number nine, Chael, as as a formal vote um, previously to a, limit it to the fifteen numbers, fifteen members on item number nine on the bylaw changes. So I think it was made, and it would probably have to be modified. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And that and that's I just I'm I'm concerned that we may have hampered the previous three tag groups by you know not giving them the same number of members potentially. Ty, go ahead. Uh yeah, I'm just sort of can getting lost in the Roberts rules piece. The the idea oh. that we are the idea that we're formally limited to these two mechanisms with these particular voting notice and two thirds requirements. Is there a time, how does time element play into this? Because if we were, if there was some previous rule voted on that tags could be unlimited or tags were could be 20 people, and then we chose to make them 15, we didn't, we didn't do a motion to rescind some previous decision from three years before, but now because it's like three months, not three years, <laughs> We have to do it this way. It's confusing to me why we would have to go in this particular procedural track. Every time we make a change, it's often changing something that was previously decided at some previous point in time. Yeah. Not always. Sometimes it's something brand new, but many, many times it's a change to a prior set of bylaws. Like we just changed some bylaws earlier today, but we didn't do a motion to rescind a previous council decision. So I'm I'm not understanding why we're in this box. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question, Ty. And I think I touched on that when uh, I spoke to it originally. So um, there's the, the competing values here is the, the, the will of the council on the one hand, right? And how, uh, and the, the bylaws directive to comply with Robert's rules. And I'm not going to pretend to have a great answer to, a, you know, if you have a, a well, let me put it like this. A lot of, you know, in, in in the world in which Robert's Rules typically operates, like, you know, Congress and the legislature, you have a time-limited period, right? You've got a session, and then you reboot it, and you start again after signing die. That's that's not the case with the council, right? Uh, we, we kind of track our motions kind of month to month. So I think it is fair to say that everything we do is probably a modification of a motion that was made at some time and it should not be characterized. I don't think it would be right to characterize it as a, a rescinding a, a former motion or not. Um, I, I guess my advice would be if, if one wants to, if, if the council is, is committed to trying to do its best to comply with Robert's rules, which is what the bylaws provide, that if a change is made uh, to a motion that was previously adopted at at a prior meeting or, or recently, right, with the with the same members of the council, that that the better way of doing it would be to provide notice in an agenda and then take a vote on that and and kind of in the or and maybe avoid doing it organically as the meeting progresses. Uh, for our purposes here, for our purposes here, I mean, the solution would be if the council is concerned about this, revisit the vote on expanding it to eighteen. If you don't have time at this meeting, maybe do it at the next meeting, have notice of it, take the vote, you're done. That's one option. There are other options too, uh, but those are more policy issues than actually um, Robert's Rules issues. And I'm here to speak to the Robert's Rules issues. That's the best I can offer up. Tom? Yeah, I'm... Did, if we at some time, you know, and I'm starting to get lost in this too, you know, I mean, it's we're so far in the weeds. If we had, at some point in time voted to allow 18 members on the commercial energy code tag, and that was the vote that we I took. Mean, like 20 minutes. Can yeah. we just, and and if what we're trying to accomplish is is insert that into the bylaws, can't we just ratify that vote that vote to amend the bylaws with that vote just by ratification. I know we do it when we rat if the chair were to sign something and yeah. we ratify that action to make it, you know, permanent or whatever it is, you know. Can't we take that same approach here? Well, I, so I want to distinguish, and I don't want to chew up too much folks' times, but I, I want to distinguish taking a vote on the bylaws 
which is one thing. And then a motion that was made previously. The, the, the motion that was made previously was not a change to the bylaws. It was just a motion that was established what the, as I understand it, what the um, criteria, the policy, what right was, is of the, of the council moving forward. But I mean, Tom, to your point, yes. The, the, again, that's the tension. The council want, needs to be able to express its will. It should do it in, in accordance with the ground rules that have been established under Robert's rules. But Robert's rules is a very significant piece of work, right? That has lots of challenging cul-de-sacs and, and other things in it. So uh, at the end of the day, I would just, you know, use your best discretion on how to move forward with this. But, you know, this is uh, this was an issue that was identified. And there are some options on how to address it. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, that motion was made at the beginning of the meeting to limit the tags to 15. And then we went on to the, the three tags. I think it was the same day. I don't recall if we did yeah, all it, four of the tags that day. It was the, uh, my understanding it was the same day, but I, I you, you, you caught me. I didn't actually review the meeting. Yeah, Roger. Yeah, there's been talk about you know the policy decision, what the what the council discussed and voted on, and again, this is another one. I mean, we're talking about going back and redoing what we had done. We we spent. A whole lot of time at a meeting or two ago talking about 15 or 18. I will remind everybody the reason that we started limiting it to 15 is there were some really good arguments about the some of the uh, tags being too large and not, not being able to get a quorum at some of the meetings. So after a whole lot of conversation, we decided, okay, let's limit it to 15 voting members. And in case there's some, you know, there's there can be more members, but there's only 15 voting members. And then Yes, we did talk about 18. I, I think the, eight, you know, the, the rationale was is the, uh, the energy code is a lot more, uh, whether it's a full code that we write or modification, I'm not sure. There's a lot more work that goes into it. So we've done a whole lot of work and, and now I'm hearing, I understand there may be Robert's rules error or inconsistency maybe is the right word. Um, I just, you know, again, the will of, of the council in the past votes was 18 and 15. So I want to figure out, again, the best way to do it. And and I don't think it's just to go through and say 18 for everybody, because we spent a whole lot of time making a decision that we're better off for 15 <laughs> for, for the typical tag. So um, however we can move forward, um, and again, I'll, I'll, that's my, my thoughts on it and all that. Chell and Derek and Damon kind of figure out what's our best path forward. Okay, Chell and Micah, and I'll remind everybody we have seven minutes. No, I don't think we've ever struggled with a quorum for the energy code tag, except occasionally when we hit a you know middle of summer vacation meeting, and we just try not to call those. Um, yeah, what's the right thing to do to get the tag makeup that we spent a lot of time talking about voting on? and may have made a Robert's Rules mistake on, in terms of the actual execution of that, what's the way to remedy that? And is that today? Is that the next meeting? And we do have schedules and actual work to do, so. Yeah, well, let me jump in. I, I'm not saying anyone made a Robert's Rules mistake. I'm just advising on what Robert's Rules says uh, and what actually happened and transpired at that meeting. Again, we haven't dissected that at all. So. Um, the the clearest solution to that is the one that I offered before. If there are concerns, right, that 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 there wasn't adequate notice regarding the fact that you know the um, the number of spots on the tags for this specific one was there were there adequate notice that that vote was going to be taken or that was going to be an issue that was considered, you could do it at the next meeting. Increase tag amount or tag number to 18 to be an agenda item. You do it, it, you know, you need eight votes for that. Otherwise you could do it at this meeting. You'd need two thirds potentially uh, to avoid a concern that there wasn't adequate notice about it. Um, I, from this discussion, it's clear to me already, this is very confusing and uh, as clear as mud, which is the last thing that I wanna do. Um, but 
th that's one solution. I, I'm not particularly, I'm just keeping it real. Maybe it's because it's late in the meeting. I'm not particularly interested in, in having, calling out potential marginal violations. I'm saying that this is marginal or otherwise violations of Robert's rules and then you know fixing them and having to go back every time and take revotes and all the rest of that. But if somebody raises an issue, I want us to take that seriously. And if people feel interested in, in taking steps to correct it, then then that's an obvious way to go about doing it. Uh, otherwise, you know, you can move forward with it and, you know, um, uh, see if there's any further objections. It, it'll be up to you. And the two thirds we need, if we did something today, would that be 10, which is every single council member here? Yes. That's the two thirds we're talking about? Yeah, so it'd be two, two thirds. In the past, when we've said two thirds of the council, it's two thirds of the voting members of the council, which would be, um, we have, yeah. and, and we've had this conversation before as to whether it's people who are present. This is the Roger question, yeah. right? It's people who are no. present, or is it people who aren't present? And and that's a potentially a bylaws issue that we could address. Hey, maybe we can yeah. add that to the bylaws while we're here. Question. But, sure. Question. Uh, question. No. Yeah. It, um, if we kick this to the next meeting to potentially fix the potential issue, um, does that affect the appointment of tag members that would affect any anything on the schedule? No. Okay, then why don't we do this at the next meeting? I feel like if we want to dot all the I's and cross all the T's as many times as we need to, let's let's do it. Let's do it at the next meeting. And that way we can figure out all the legal strategies or all the whatever things that need to happen so that all the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted. Okay, I've got uh, four hands up yet. Uh, we've got less than less than three minutes. Is there a motion to extend another 15? Yeah, I'll move to extend the meeting another 15 minutes. Hoping it won't take that long, but that's what my motion is. Second? Is there a second? Nobody wants to second it. I guess I want to hear Roger what what. I just I, I I'm if we can handle it in two minutes. My comment I think I was next is if we do no action today, we put on the agenda the eighteen members, including changing item nine of the of okay. the. Um, I'll second it. <laughs> So you're seconding extending because I, I agree we we should get through number nine today and I think okay. we could in 15 more minutes. Okay. okay. Uh, all in favor of extending the meeting meeting 15 minutes. Aye. Aye. Opposed. Okay, motion carries. Uh Roger, then Micah, then Katie, then Tom. All right. So so my question is is if we do nothing today, um you know, we need to, we publicize at the, on the agenda for the next meeting that we are confirming the, mod, the the changes made in our previous meetings to have 18 members on the commercial energy code. And we are making the changes to item number nine on the bylaws to memorialize that. That's out, it's public. Uh, and we address it at the next meeting. Okay. That's that. That's one path forward, and I I would certainly support that. Okay. So. I don't think that needs to be formalized in a motion. We just we simply continue the business to the next meeting. Uh, Micah, you were uh, you were next. Well, uh, actually, to, to Roger's point, though, uh, sorry to to jump in. Uh, he was being. Uh, uh, kind of prescriptive about what the expectation would be on the agenda, which is, is I think, an important point. I don't think you need a motion for that, but you, uh, we don't want to lose sight of it. I, I think, Stoyan, you got the you got the gist of that, correct? Uh, item nine is here because uh, the vote wasn't to add it to the the bylaws. But again, the direction for the council uh, for the council staff it's clear. Uh, we will post it for the next time. There, there is no need for a vote right now. Okay. All right. Micah, go ahead, please. Thank you all for the robust discussion on Robert's rules. Um, I, I think that some action needs to be taken. Uh, my comment 
for this portion is specific to item nine as shown on the screen, since that's the only place anyone could find it for the public is to see it on the screen during this meeting. Um, I, I was one of the vocal opponents to the 18 voting members. Again, you're diminishing the importance of other tags. Uh, this is the state building code council, not the state energy code council. Um, so to have, you know, a special number for a tag and, and again, make this a special code, um, it, it's not stated anywhere in the bylaws or the RCWs that this has to be special. So it's not equitable and it diminishes others. Um, the other tags and the other, say, stakeholders that believe their, their codes are important as well. So I think you should either lower the number to 15, as was previously voted, or raise the other numbers to 18. Even if you can't get a quorum, I understand that's something we're trying to solve. But again, we're not called the State Energy Code Council. Uh, in addition to that, the last sentence here says that the recruitment shall stay open until the position is filled. If the council does pass this language today, I would encourage staff to change the messaging on the homepage of the SBCC, which states that the tag recruitment closed March 8th. Thanks. Thank you. Joe? Um, to respond to Micah, the energy code is actually under a different RCW than the rest of the codes. Um, and we've never struggled with the quorum. So I think it is, it's different. I don't think that having more tag members makes it special or more important. I think that just means we need a wider variety of points of view because it is contentious. Um, so I, I, I think it, having more members is not a bad thing. Um, and I don't think that makes it special um, in, in, in an importance kind of way. Katie? Yeah, I mean, I, I lowered my hand because um, Roger said what I was going to say. And then, Chell, I feel like you just said what I wanted to say again. But I, I also feel like I'm a little frustrated with this because I don't want to relitigate this. We've already voted on it. Um, understanding that maybe two thirds vote to change the bylaws um, is where the discussion will be. Um, but it does feel like we've addressed this and spending a ton of time next time. Um, I hope I hope that we can get through it. That's all. And Tom? I'd like to make a motion that we accept number nine as written as a change to the bylaws. Second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Um, Again, this, this this would need a, a two thirds vote. Uh, ben, go ahead. Yeah, right right now it's written as energy code tags, so it's identifying both the commercial and residential. I guess um, we haven't reviewed the residential seats yet, so I don't I don't know if we want to spe like specify commercial or um, revote and add residential later, or um, if there's a, a way of handling that that we could do. Uh, yeah, and, and again, we're not limiting participation by people. We're just talking about the voting members here. So I don't know why the we need extra voting members on these two tags, but anyhow, my, uh, Chell, go ahead. Yeah, my opinion is similar that we don't struggle with the quorum and that having more points of view is, is a better thing um, for such a contentious uh, code. So I, I support, I think it's fine without saying commercial and residential or saying, but I support both of them being in that category. Okay. Uh, Micah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I just have to jump in here and, and kind of rebut what Chael is saying that the energy code being complex is the reason it needs more input and subject matter experts. That is quite stunning considering the breadth of information that the building code and the residential code both cover. Um, again, that's kind of why I'm questioning why those tags don't have 18 voting members and why we would limit them to 14 if that is the argument for the energy code tag. Uh, both the building code and residential codes in some instances do cover energy code topics among others, including structural, uh, egress, accessibility. So to say that uh, 
those tags aren't needing or in need of those additional voting members either or opinions because the energy code is more complex is, is quite stunning. So uh, I don't think that's a valid argument. If it is, then we should actually increase the voting members for the other tags. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I will echo what Micah said that, you know, the building code and residential code are cover life safety issues. And I think that's the most important uh, duty we have as council members. Uh, Shell, go ahead. Yeah, Micah, I didn't use the word complex. I said contentious. Um, so, I, yes, it's complex. So the building code is very, very complex, probably more complex than the energy code. Um, but I use the word contentious. Katie? Well, and I would add that, Jill, I was going to say the same thing, but also that um, the he said that it's under a different code and there's no problem getting quorum. And that hasn't been the case for the other tags. If that's my understanding. Okay. Uh, seeing no further discussion, uh, let's call for a roll call vote. Oh, I'm sorry, Adam, did you want to, or Bill? Yeah, Bill Will from Washington Solar Energy Industry Association. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I've been uh, attending the code council meetings uh, regularly, four in a row since uh, December to address this issue. We've been in support of uh, dedicated uh, spots in both energy code tags for the solar industry. And uh, we hope that continues and we support uh, the 18 members on both of those uh, tags. I believe uh, the extra number of voices is useful. And as, as Chell mentioned, uh, there's a lot of contentious things they're discussing. So having more folks at the table is valuable and would support, Wasi would definitely support keeping the number at 18. Okay. Bill, thank you for your input. Um, and again, I'll, I'll say it again. It's the number of votes, not the number of people participating. Uh, Roger, go ahead. Um, I will just add it is more, the energy code is more contentious, but it is also um, the one that is changing the fastest um the just you know solar the solar is, is one case but things with the energy code are changing very very quickly so again having more people more experts uh, makes sense to me and i'm certainly supportive of having more experts you know the the roberts rules piece i'm i'm going to support the motion um but at the end of the day it makes a lot of sense to me so okay um, I'm just going to go on the record now and say that I am not going to support the motion so we can we can move to push this to the next meeting, uh, as we had discussed prior to this, or go ahead and take the vote and have it fail. Well, you can take the vote and have it fail and then re re do it again for another meeting. I mean, okay. right. with that, uh, and, and, and I want to say one other thing, Damon. Um, uh, and excuse me, and, and I, I want to do this in part to honor Roger. We've had very good discussions in the past regarding the two thirds requirement in statute and what that means as far as uh, members. We've never had a discussion, and I'm prepared to have a discussion with folks offline, uh, the Stoyan or otherwise, regarding a two thirds Ro Roberts rules vote for members present or whether it has to be members present or total members of the voting members. Uh, if there's a specific requirement. And so that uh, today's vote might implicate that, uh, but uh, I, I don't want to lose sight of that specific issue. Okay. And I think because this is a bylaw change, it's pretty specific. That two oh, well, percent. that's easy. Yeah, the bylaws change, I think, in the bylaws, although it's not clear, uh, this would not be members present. So, okay. Tom? Thank you. Uh, I'd prefer to table this if we could and just want to see if there's support for, for that without making a motion. A motion to table is a privileged motion. So is, is that a motion to table? I just I just want to raise the question with before doing that. Yeah, I think this motion to table this is a good one. Okay. Uh, is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Todd, did you make a motion to table? Oh, I, okay, I'll take the motion. Shell can <laughs> take okay. a second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to the table. Uh, let's do a roll call vote. Shell Anderson. Yes. Uh, Jay Arnold, Todd Byruther. Aye. Justin Borgo. Aye. Tom Handy. Aye. 
Angela Hobb. Aye. Uh, Roger Haringa. Aye. Matthew Hepner. Craig Holt. Ty Menser. Aye. Uh, ben Omura. Yes. Pete Rickey. Katie Sheehan. Yes. <clears throat> and Damon Doyle. I don't think this needs a uh, super majority. No. Nope. Eight to one. Okay. Motion is tabled. Um, so I think we're going to bring up item nine at the next meeting and and discuss the language there. So we've kind of done it twice. We both tabled it and already added it to next month's agenda. Sheldon, do you have something else? I put your hand up. Yeah, I mean, we kind of designated authority for tag member appointments in our bylaws approvals, didn't we? I believe so, yeah. Uh, rec recommended by the chair and approved by the executive committee. Yep. And then I, yeah. We will contact the tag chairs next week. With uh, again, we'll clean up the list and uh, we will have it sent to you. Okay. Uh, Tom, yeah, I just want to confirm since things have been kind of bouncing all over the place that we have approved everything except for item nine and these proposed changes. Is that correct? So mm -hmm. all those can be written as adopted by the council as of this point on. That is yes. my recollection. Yeah, that's what I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Chell? I have something when we get to other business. Okay. Um, Three minutes. Go ahead. Somebody say something. I was just stating we have three minutes until... Yeah, three minutes. Uh, do we want to move to... Uh, uh, move item 10 and 12 to uh, the next meeting. Does that, does that require a motion? If you run out of time, you run out of time. Okay. Okay. Uh, do, 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 but having said that, if you want to direct them to put the staff to put it on the next uh, agenda, that's, that's. Uh, yeah, that would, that would be the chair's preference. Uh, Chell, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine tabling 10. I wanted to bring up uh, 6291 requires council members to receive training on ethics. And I wanted to see where we are on that and who provides that and when we would get that. I believe we did that uh, 18 months ago. If I recall. We, yes, okay. we hit it with uh, 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 dear, what was uh, yeah, the... Uh, the, the training, I, as I recall, was by two. It was the Executive Ethics Board. Um, yes, that's correct. Right. Then we also had the uh, Legislative Ethics Board uh, representative provided training. Too. We have new members, and we're going to have more new members. And just want to make sure that that's in process and all happy. We will need the training for technical advisory group members and we'll need the training for the uh, council members. We will start working on it most likely uh, May, first week of May. Okay, uh, we're down to less than a minute unless somebody wants to extend. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Third, fourth, fifth. <laughs> okay, Thank thanks you. guys, I appreciate it. Thanks everybody, take care. Thank you everybody. Thanks. Thank you.